In our first funny story of the day, we bring you a medical mishap and a guy with a rash. Calling all history buffs and giggle lovers. Get ready for today's funny story joke that's a medical mystery tour through time. Imagine doctors back in the day diagnosing you by your tongue color and prescribing something that smells like grandma's attic and tastes suspiciously like dirt tea. Now picture hospitals with enough acronyms to make your head spin and bills that could launch a rocket to the moon to escape those bills. Buckle up because a penny-pinching businessman walks into a doctor's office with a very puzzling rash. Stay tuned, folks. This punchline's a doozy. A tale of two traditions, a wacky look at how we used to patch ourselves up and still do, kinda. Ah, healthcare. The glorious land of needles, enough jargon to make a parrot cry and bills that could buy a small island nation. But fear not, intrepid explorer of overpriced band-aids. Today, we embark on a historical comedy tour of medical practices in China and America, proving that even the most serious topics can be a laugh riot. Just don't faint from it. That would require actual medical attention. China, acupuncture, emperors, and herbs that might be dirt. China boasts a medical tradition older than your great, 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 great grandma. We're talking over 3,000 years of history. Back then, fancy doctors honed their skills in herbal remedies and a technique called pulse diagnosis, which basically involved feeling your wrist and hoping for the best. Imagine having a dedicated physician whose sole job was to make sure you didn't keel over from a hangnail. That was life for Chinese emperors. They were all about preventative care, which is why they also enjoyed things like moxibustion, burning dried mugwort on specific points. Sounds relaxing, right? China wasn't a medical hermit kingdom. They traded their medical knowledge like they were trading silk scarves. Fun fact, smallpox inoculation, which saved countless lives, originated in China and eventually reached Europe, revolutionizing disease prevention although they probably didn't have the cute cartoon band-aids we do today. America, bloodletting, booze, and the rise of science. Thank goodness. Early American medicine was like a Wild West saloon brawl of medical practices. You had European traditions, Native American remedies, and whatever crazy concoctions the local healer cooked up in their basement. Bloodletting, a practice based on the idea that bad humors caused illness, was surprisingly popular, despite its questionable effectiveness. Seriously, just imagine the doctor saying, you seem a bit under the weather, let's drain some blood. The 19th century brought a much needed scientific revolution to American medicine. We finally started figuring out how our bodies actually work, which led to things like anesthesia. Thank the medical gods for that. The 20th century saw an explosion of medical advancements in America. Antibiotics, vaccines, and fancy new surgical techniques became the norm, leading to a dramatic leap in life expectancy. Today, American healthcare relies heavily on pharmaceuticals, technology, and a whole army of specialized doctors who you might spend a small fortune just to see for five minutes. The future. A mashup of needles and pills? Despite their different paths through history, both China and America are starting to see the value of combining traditional and modern practices. Scientists are looking at the science behind traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, while Chinese hospitals are embracing Western technologies. Who knows, maybe the future of healthcare will involve a delightful blend of acupuncture needles and prescription pills. Just don't picture it too literally, please. Bonus fun facts. Did you know foot binding, the painful custom of deforming women's feet, wasn't outlawed in China until the early 20th century? Talk about barbaric beauty standards. The US Civil War, with its horrific injuries and primitive medical care, serves as a chilling reminder of just how far medicine has come. Seriously, if you ever need a reason to be thankful for modern antibiotics, just Google Civil War Gangrene. 
Both China and America still struggle with making healthcare accessible and affordable for everyone. But hey, at least we're not sticking leeches on people anymore, right? Right? This whirlwind tour through medical history proves that even the most serious topics can be a chuckle fest. Remember, laughter is the best medicine, although some actual medicine might be helpful too. So the next time you encounter a medical mystery, whether it's a skyrocketing bill or a sudden craving for acupuncture, just remember, it's all part of the hilarious and sometimes frustrating adventure called healthcare. Okay, enough history for now. Let's ditch the dusty textbooks and dive headfirst into this hilarious medical mystery. While in China, an American single man acts promiscuous and does not use protection the entire time he is there. A week after arriving back home in the States, he wakes one morning to find his swimsuit area covered with bright green and purple spots. Horrified, he immediately goes to see a doctor. The doctor, never having seen anything like this before, orders some tests and tells the man to return in two days for the results. After two days, the doctor tells him, I've got bad news for you. You have contracted Mongolian VD. It's very rare and almost unheard of here in the US. We know very little about it. The man perplexed asks, Well, can't you give me a shot or something to fix me up, doc? The doctor answers, I'm sorry, there's no known cure. We are going to have to amputate. Wait, what? The man screams in horror. Absolutely not. I want a second opinion. The doctor replies, Well, it's your choice. Go ahead if you want, but surgery is your only option. The man shops around, going to many doctors and experts, but they all tell him the same. They must remove the organ. At some point, a friend tells him, You contracted this in China, right? Then why not go to a Chinese doctor? The man, Having not thought of that, seeks out a Chinese doctor in the hopes he'll know more about the disease. The Chinese doctor examines the problematic area and proclaims, Ah, yes, Mongolian VD, very rare disease. The guy says to the doctor, Yeah, yeah, I already know that. But what can we do? My American doctor wants to cut off my organ. The Chinese doctor shakes his head and laughs. Stupid American doctors always want to operate. Make more money that way. No need to amputate. Oh, thank God. Yes, yes, you wait two more weeks. Um, it will fall off by itself. <laughs> In our second funny story of the week, we delve into alcohol and the reason people get more clever, or so they think, when they get tipsy. In today's funny story joke, ever wondered why your Uncle Larry, after a six-pack, suddenly becomes a geopolitical expert. Yeah, me neither. But some folks swear a few drinks make them smarter, sharper, basically Einstein's with a beer belly. Well, buckle up, because science is about to blow your mind, or what's left of it after that tequila shot. Stay tuned until the end of the joke. Now, picture Mother Nature as a gym teacher with a clipboard, ruthlessly weeding out the weaklings. Predators snag the slowest gazelles, the lions with bad knees get kicked out of the pride. Talk about a savage retirement plan. It's all about survival of the fittest, you see. Doctors, those party poopers, will tell you booze kills brain cells. True, but here's the juicy secret they don't want you to know. It's like a cosmic game of whack-a-mole, but with your brain. Alcohol targets the laziest, most useless brain cells, the ones that send messages slower than a sloth on vacation. Think of them as the pigeons of the brain world, just taking up space and crapping all over your good ideas. Imagine your brain as a pride of lions. In this pride, you've got your strong, fast lions and your weak, slow ones. The strong lions are the brain cells that work efficiently, processing thoughts and memories quickly. The weak lions are the brain cells that are sluggish, struggling to keep up with the rest. When you take a drink, it's like a predator entering the pride. The alcohol, that ruthless hunter, targets the weak lions first, those slow, inefficient brain cells. It's survival of the fittest. The weak lions get picked off, leaving the strong, agile ones to dominate the pride. With fewer weak lions in the way, the pride, your brain, can function more efficiently. Thoughts move faster, 
ideas come quicker, and suddenly you feel like a genius, at least until the buzz wears off. History is littered with examples, philosophers pondering life's mysteries after a flagon of wine, writers churning out bestsellers after a few pints, looking at you, Hemingway, with your questionable icebergs. These geniuses weren't just indulging vices, they were conducting high-powered brain cell purges. But, and it's a big but, moderation is key. Just as too many predators would decimate the pride, too much alcohol can overwhelm your brain. If all the lions, weak and strong, get taken out, you're left with a pride that's struggling to function. Your brain turns into a chaotic mess, like a rush hour traffic jam with no one in control. And nobody's a genius when they're stuck in that kind of gridlock, especially the kind with flashing police lights. So, raise a glass, responsibly of course, to the great brain cell purge. Cheers to sharper minds, faster thinking, and hopefully not forgetting where you parked the car. Remember folks, even the mightiest lions need to rest. Too much of a good thing can turn your mental savanna into a barren wasteland. And if you do drink too much, don't worry. Just tell everyone you're on a brain detox cleanse. Trust me, it sounds way fancier than I got hammered and lost my car keys. Cheers to smarter lions and fewer embarrassing stories. <laughs> In our third funny story, we bring you an old man and a problem with, shall we just say, a little worm and hairspray. Hairspray. Fancy glue for your head or secret rocket fuel? You decide. In today's funny story joke, we ditch the chemicals and go full Willy Wonka with sugar water hairspray. Spoiler alert, it's gonna get messy. Picture this, a mischievous little dude named Timmy teaching his grandpa a lesson or two on how to put certain things back where they belong. Who knew hairspray can be used for that hack? Buckle up, giggle heads, because this sticky showdown has a twist that'll leave you laughing and questioning your childhood beauty hacks. But first, we gotta dive into this sugar-coated extravaganza. Stay tuned. The great hair hold up, hairspray versus sugar water, a sticky showdown for the ages with a shocking twist. Ah, hair. The crowning glory, the main of mystery, and sometimes the tangled mess that mocks our attempts at control. But fear not, fellow follicle wranglers, for we have two valiant warriors in this battle for hold, the mighty hairspray and its surprisingly sweet challenger, sugar water. Buckle up, because this is about to get hilarious and a little scientific. Hairspray, the modern marvel, questionable ingredients edition. Hairspray. It's the pocket-sized bodyguard for your hairstyle, the wind's worst nightmare. A spritz of this stuff and fly away cower in fear, like a rogue feather duster meeting a Roomba on steroids. It offers a range of holding powers, from a gentle wave hello to a gravity-defying ain't nobody moving this mane. However, like any superhero, hairspray has its weaknesses. Overuse transforms your hair from a masterpiece to a crunchy, helmet-like creation more suited for a porcupine convention than a night out. Product buildup becomes a real issue, leaving you with a mane as dull and lifeless as yesterday's toast. Plus, let's not forget the fascinating list of ingredients that often reads like a rejected science experiment. Acrylates, copolymer. Basically, fancy glue for your hair. Great for hold, not so great for brushing. Dimethyl ether and propane. These propel the good stuff and potentially propel you into a sneezing fit if you're not careful. Fragrance. The industry's catch-all term for a secret blend of chemicals that might smell like berries, but could actually be distant cousins to rocket fuel. Sugar water, the OG hairspray, and a sticky situation. Long before the invention of hairspray, our resourceful ancestors wielded a secret weapon so sweet it could give Willy Wonka a sugar rush. Sugar water. Yes, you heard that right. This DIY concoction involved dissolving a bathtub full of sugar, because cavities were clearly a fad back then, in water and using it as a styling agent. 
Hold? Think more of a gentle suggestion than a firm grip. A strong breeze could send your carefully crafted hair flying faster than a squirrel on Red Bull. But hold on, pun intended, because sugar water has one undeniable advantage, shine. You'd basically become a walking disco ball, guaranteed to light up any room, or at least confuse everyone around you. Rain, however, would be your ultimate nemesis, transforming your hairstyle into a melted lollipop situation. Not ideal for a first date, unless you're going for the human candy floss look. The science of hold, hairspray versus hair roots. Now, let's delve into the nitty gritty of hair biology. Hair grows from tiny pockets in your scalp, called follicles. These follicles produce a protein called keratin, which is the main building block of hair. Here's where our hair warriors come in. Hairspray. While hairspray works its magic on the hair shaft, the visible part of your hair, it doesn't directly affect the hair follicle at the root. However, excessive use can lead to product buildup on the scalp, potentially clogging pores and hindering hair growth. Think of it like blocking the doorway to your hair's personal gym. Sugar water. This sticky situation doesn't offer much hold, but the sugar content can actually feed the scalp microbiome, the good bacteria that live there. A healthy scalp microbiome can contribute to healthy hair growth. However, too much sugar can also disrupt this delicate balance, leading to irritation and potential hair loss. Alrighty, giggleheads, ditch the hairspray. For now, because things are about to get sticky. We're talking sugar water, vintage vibes, and a hair-raising showdown that'll leave you questioning your childhood beauty hacks, and maybe a little worried about ants. Forget the fancy chemicals and rocket fuel disguised as a pleasant mist. We're going full Willy Wonka with DIY hair control. Now, here's the twist. Grandpa John watched how little Timmy pulled a worm out of the ground and told him that if he could put it back in, he would give him a hundred bucks. Little Timmy left for a bit and said, Okay, Grandpa, watch this. Timmy then pushed the worm right back down the hole it came out from. Grandpa got out the 10 bucks and gave it to Timmy. Timmy said, Grandpa, I can't keep this because I cheated. I sprayed the worm with hairspray. That's why I was able to do that. No, you keep it. The next morning at breakfast, Grandpa walked to Timmy and gave him another 10 bucks. No, Grandpa, you already paid me. That money was from Grandma. In the last funny story of today's compilation, we bring you, as promised, our best story of the week. After the joke, should you want to get notified of next week's compilation or when we publish new content, then please press the subscribe button and the bell icon, and you will get notified of any new content. Thanks for watching. Here goes. In today's funny story, we meet a passionate marriage counselor with a shocking discovery. It turns out there's a clear link between, well, let's just say it involves some fun between spouses and a whole lot of happiness and energy. But hold on, there's a twist. This counselor sets out on a mission to spread the good word, but during a live presentation, things get a little unexpected. Will his research hold water or is there something more to this story? Stay tuned until the end of the joke for a laugh that'll leave you wanting more. A marriage counselor has done intensive research on the connection between making love and happiness. The results are not as simple as they sound. Many people claim that they have all sorts of pains and look for excuses not to make love on a regular basis. Then why would they do it if they are not happier without it? However, the marriage counselor found that the more times a person makes love, the happier they are. And not only that, making love regularly also has other benefits, such as giving one much more energy for your daily tasks. He then made it his calling to spread the message throughout the country and thus make many more people happy and energetic. He begins a countrywide tour to present his message of marriage revival through a small course. He travels from town to town and invites the people to attend the first day of his course for free. During his lecture, he illustrates his research by interactive means. He asks the audience, can we please get a person on stage who makes love daily? 
from the back of the hall, a man came running onto the stage while shadow boxing between the chairs. It's a clear sign of a man who has an excess of energy. Secondly, he asks the audience if there might be someone who makes love twice a week to come to the stage. A man stands up, walks briskly towards the stage while whistling a tune. Now he is looking for a person who makes love every second week on a Sunday afternoon after lunch. He asks such a person to come to the stage. There is a man standing slowly out of his chair and walks slowly towards the stage while he is constantly yawning. Clearly this man needs a lot more energy. Now he asks the audience if there might be someone who makes love only once a month and can such a person please come to the stage. In the front row is a man who can barely get up from his chair. The people next to him must help him to get up properly. He walks very slowly towards the stage, but doesn't have the energy to get up the steps. The other men who are already on the stage then help him up the steps. So far, the interactive illustration has worked very well, and all the people's mouths are literally hanging open as witness interactive illustration. The energy of the men who joined the marriage counselor on stage is exactly in line with his research. Now, just to put the nail in the coffin, he asks for the last time if there might be a man in the hall who makes love only once a year. If there is such a man, then can this person please come to the stage? He understands that such a person has no energy at all, and if he must then, they will be helped to get to the stage. To his amazement, a guy jumps up in the back of the crowd, does a bunch of cartwheels down the aisle between the spectators, and just jumps from the bottom to the top of the stage. The man does this by shouting, Kia ha, you old devil. The marriage counselor is now dumbfounded because such energy runs counter to his experience and research. He asks the man, Are you sure that you only make love once a year? Yes, said the man with a broad smile on his face. The marriage counselor then asks for the man. Now my research shows energy levels in relation to the frequency with which you make love. Also, you would have seen from all the people who accompanied us on stage, that this is in line with my research. Now tell me where all your energy comes from. The man answered. Excitement, that's where my energy comes from. Excitement, please explain to us what you are so excited about. The marriage counselor asks. The man got the biggest smile the marriage counselor had ever seen and answered. Tonight is that night. In our first funny story joke of the week, we tell you how pigs got so delicious. In today's funny story joke episode of What Were We Thinking Animal Antics Edition, we head down to the muddiest, snortiest corner of the farmyard, Pig City. Now, these guys get a bad rap for being, well, a little leisurely. But before you judge a book by its floppy ears, let's just say Babe wasn't the only brainiac in the pig pen. So, the real question isn't, are they dumb? But rather, why the lounging lizard act? Buckle up, folks, because the answer to that juicy question is coming up after the break. We'll also be taking a hilarious detour to see who else showed up late to the characteristic distribution party hosted by the big guy upstairs. Spoiler alert, let's just say some animals got all the good stuff while others got stuck with the leftover weirdness. Stay tuned, and remember, laughter is the best medicine. Besides that stuff pigs might discover in their future fancy lab coats. Just saying. Move over, lassie. There's a new Brainiac in town, and it comes complete with a corkscrew tail and a penchant for belly rubs. Yes, I'm talking about pigs. Those adorable oinks with more intellectual horsepower than you might expect. Forget Hollywood's talking swine. Real-life pigs are studious aces, remembering complex tasks, like that special piggy bank trick that led to a bacon bonanza months later. They're basically walking Rolodexes with snouts. These brainy porkers are also navigational ninjas. Don't be fooled by the cute piglets bouncing around the sky. They're training for the Piglympics, a future event perhaps. With their inner GPS, they're maze-running champions, finding the fastest route to a mud puddle or, if they're feeling adventurous, the nearest donut. 
Speaking of tools, pigs are the original oinker engineers. Don't expect spaceships, but they have a surprising knack for getting things done. Need a comfy napping spot? No problem. Just grab a stick and watch them dig like pros. Feeling a bit vain? Pigs have even been known to use mirrors to check out their undeniably intelligent reflections. Step aside, Mario. There's a new contender in town. Pigs are surprisingly adept at mastering touchscreen games. They use their snouts to navigate, strategize, and achieve their goals, all while potentially oinking insults at the virtual pigs they're trouncing. Social butterflies with excellent sniffing skills, pigs are the ultimate party animals, minus the dancing, because of hooves. They form strong bonds, communicate like gossip queens at a pigsty salon, and even show empathy towards their fellow oinkers. Basically, they're the most supportive friend group you could ask for, as long as you don't mind sharing your snacks. So, the next time you see a pig snoozing in the mud, don't underestimate that snorting scholar. Their minds are like well-cured hams, full of surprising depth and flavor. Who knows, maybe someday we'll have prestigious universities like Swineford or Hogwarts, with a touch of magic, of course, where these brilliant creatures can truly reach their full potential. Just imagine the possibilities, a world powered by pig-engineered wind farms made of mud, or a cure for the common cold discovered by a team of bespectacled pigs in tiny lab coats. The future is looking bright, and it's definitely smelling like truffles. All right, folks, gather around the virtual campfire for some Animal Kingdom gossip. Picture this, the Almighty is throwing a cosmic pool party, handing out personality traits like pool floats, Lions are snagging the bravery floaties. Dolphins are grabbing the social butterfly pool noodles. But who gets stuck with the inflatable inner tube of laziness? You guessed it, the pigs. It's a sunny day with all the kingdom's animals gathered around when God is handing out characteristics to all of the animals, and he's getting close to the end of the list. All the animals have picked except the lions, the beavers, and the pigs. God looks up from the list and says, who wants courage? One of the pigs says to another, Ooh, we should get that. The other one says, Nah, who wants to be courageous? You have to strut around. Humans will start hunting you. It's a huge pain. Let's wait. The lions speak up and take the courage. Next up, industrious. Who wants to be known for being industrious? Hey, we could definitely be that. Make stuff, stay busy, it sounds good. The other pig says, Are you crazy? Get up at dawn? Work all day? Who wants that? I'm sure God saved the best for last. The beavers pipe up and take industriousness, so God goes back to his list. Next up, we have wings. Who wants to fly? The first pig says, Wow, we've got to get that one. We could fly all day? The second pig says, Exactly. Fly around all day, beat your wings all the time? That sounds exhausting. You'd have to fly for hours beating your wings like mad to stay aloft. No thank you. Let's wait for the really good stuff. God looks at his list, getting to the end. Let's see, claws are taken, flight went to the birds, the cheetah got speed. Okay, here we go. Who wants to be delicious? <laughs> Our second funny story joke of the day is a joke about what you should not wish for. Buckle up, Buttercup, because today's funny story joke dives headfirst into the world of frogs. Now, before you start glazing over like a frog staring at a fly that's clearly out of reach, hear me out. Frogs are like the ninjas of the animal kingdom. They've been around since the dinosaurs, chilling out in the shadows for over 200 million years. Imagine a T-Rex tripping over a grumpy Goliath frog. That's a sight I'd pay to see. Speaking of Goliath frogs, these guys are the incredible hulks of the frog world. They can grow to the size of a newborn baby and weigh as much as a tub of butter, though hopefully less messy. On the other hand, you've got the Cuban tree toad, who's about the size of your thumb, the perfect hitchhiker for a hummingbird. Here's the coolest part. Frogs are basically living superheroes. They can see almost everything, except maybe what's directly behind them. Gotta work on that froggy blind spot. 
and when they gobble up a fly, their eyeballs actually pop down into their mouths to help push the food down like a built-in froggy plunger. Want to be a champion leaper? Frogs can jump over 20 times their body length. That's like a human hopping over a football field in a single bound. And some frogs can even glide through the air like tiny green parachutes. Talk about a superhero landing. Frogs come in all shapes, sizes, and most importantly, colors. Some frogs use their camouflage skills to blend in with their surroundings, like a living piece of mud or a clump of moss, perfect for hiding from hungry snakes. But some poisonous frogs are like walking neon signs, letting everyone know they're not to be messed with. These little guys can even survive some pretty extreme conditions. The wood frog can practically turn into a popsicle with 65% of its body frozen solid. Talk about playing dead taken to a whole new level. There's even a frog out there who can hold out for rain for up to seven years. That's some serious patience. And let's not forget about the amazing ways frogs reproduce. Some frog moms carry their babies around in pouches like kangaroos, while others have their young develop right on their backs. There's even a frog mom who swallows her eggs and lets them hatch in her stomach, like a living froggy nursery. So next time you see a frog, don't underestimate this amazing amphibian. They've been around for ages, they've got some incredible superpowers, and they come in a variety of wild colors and crazy reproductive styles. Frogs, they're basically the coolest little dudes and dudettes on the planet. All right, all right, hold your lily pads. Frog fanatics. We know these little green dudes are basically amphibian superheroes with built-in eyeball plungers and the leaping skills of Olympic champions. Seriously, how do they do that? But enough with the frog facts. Let's get to the real riveting story. Woman plays golf on a slightly rainy morning and hits the ball deep into the rough. When she went to look for it, she came across a poor frog caught in a trap presumably the work of a nasty witch who wants to make trouble for bug charms. If you free me, I'll give you three wishes, said the frog. The woman has a good heart and would have freed him anyway without the wishes. When the frog was free, he said, but you have to think carefully. Of everything you wish, your husband gets 10 times more. The woman agrees, and her first wish is to be the most beautiful woman in the whole world. The frog warns her and says, just remember, this will mean that your husband will be 10 times more attractive than you. He will be a magnet to every woman like a candle to a moth. I don't care. I am the most beautiful woman in the world, so he will only have eyes for me. Said the woman Kabam, and she is the most beautiful woman in the world. For her second win, she wants to be the richest woman in the world. The frog warns her again, this will then mean that your husband is the richest man in the world, 10 times richer than you. I do not care. We are married in community of property, so we will both have the same amount. Kabam. She is the richest woman in the world. Her third wish is a little more difficult. What does she want that her husband will get 10 times more? Unfortunately, money makes people greedy, and suddenly she gets an inspiration. For my third wish, please. I would like to have a mild heart attack. At the same moment, her husband also gets one, but 10 times lighter than hers. <laughs> Our third funny story joke of the day is about this guy that landed himself with some monks, and then he heard a noise. Buckle up, giggle gang because today's funny story joke dives into the hilarious world of monks, those guys who make watching paint dry look like a rave. First, let's peek behind the curtain of their supposedly serene lives. Here's the thing about monks. They were the original shut-ins, but way cooler, and with way less takeout pizza boxes piled up. Imagine history class as scrolling through your ex's social media after a bad breakup. Everything seems filtered and staged, perfect vacation photos, inspirational quotes about finding inner peace, and way too many pictures of their adorable new cat. Because of course, they got a cat. It all screams, look how happy I am without you. 
That's kinda how history portrays monks, serene figures in flowing robes, chanting in echoing monasteries. Basically, the ultimate relaxation app come to life, minus the soothing nature sounds. But dig a little deeper, past the carefully crafted image, and things get a bit more, well, messy. Picture them as your roommate who's obsessed with meal prepping for the entire week. Except instead of neatly labeled Tupperware containers, it's giant cauldrons of stew bubbling away, enough to feed a small village. Because, let's be honest, some monasteries basically were small villages. Forget about weekend Netflix binges. Their idea of entertainment was copying ancient texts by candlelight, meticulously illustrating the margins with fantastical creatures that looked like they were drawn during a particularly intense dream. Seriously, Google medieval bestiary. Here's the kicker. These seemingly uptight monks were surprisingly innovative. They were the original craft beer brewers of Europe. Monks and hops talk about a holy happy hour. Invented new farming techniques that are still used today because apparently even back then people wanted to maximize their kale yield and even became the OG copyright enforcers fiercely guarding their collection of painstakingly copied texts. Think of them as the medieval version of a DMCA takedown notice, minus the internet. So, the next time you think history is just a bunch of boring dates and dusty scrolls, remember, it's like scrolling through your ex's seemingly perfect social media. Beneath the surface, there's a whole lot of unexpected things going on, from secret brewing operations to artistically strange doodles, all wrapped up in a package that's way more interesting and way less likely to make you feel bad about yourself. All right, all right, enough with the history lesson already. You're probably thinking, monks? Serenity? Sounds about as exciting as watching paint dry while listening to elevator music on repeat. Hold on to your meditation beads, history buffs, and those who secretly yearn for a life of robe wearing and silence. No judgment, because here's the real tea. A man with a car that sounds like a bag of angry cats on a bumpy road cruises past a quaint monastery. Thinking his chariot might finally give up the ghost, he pulls into the driveway with a sigh. He walks up to the grand oak doors, expecting a chorus of Gregorian chants as his welcome. Instead, the doors creak open to reveal a group of monks with suspiciously youthful faces and a glint of mischief in their eyes. They usher him in with surprising enthusiasm, offering a hearty meal, mostly vegetables, but hey, free food, and a place to stay. They even take a look at his car, tinkering with it for a while with an assortment of tools and what appears to be a rubber chicken. Intrigued, the man asks if it'll hold. One monk shrugs and says, maybe for a while, as long as you don't hit any potholes or angry geese. Feeling slightly bewildered but grateful, the man settles in for the night. Just as he's about to drift off, the strange sound begins. The next morning, he asked the monks what the sound was, but they said, We can't tell you what. You are not a monk. The man is disappointed but thanks them and continues his journey. A few years later, he drove there again and decided to stay again because he had now made friends. The monks invite him in, give him food and a place to sleep. That night, he hears again the same strange sound he heard last time. The next morning, he asked again what it was, but the monks answered, We can't tell you because you are not a monk. The man wants to die of curiosity. Even if he has to become a monk to find out, he will do it. He quit his job and did a 10-year monk course. Now he is a full-fledged monk. After initiation, the other monks said, Congratulations. You are now a monk. We will now show you the source of the sound. They lead the man to a wooden door where the head monk says, The sound is real behind the door. The man tries to open the door, but it is locked. May I have the key? He asked. They give him the key, and he opens the door. Behind the wooden door is another door made of stone. The man asks for the key to the stone door. The monks give him the key, and he opens it too, only to find there is another steel door. He gets another key. This goes on until he has opened a total of seven doors. When he opened the last door, he was amazed to see the source of the sound. Would you like to know 
What is behind the door? But I cannot tell you what it is because you are not a monk. <laughs> in the fourth funny story of the day, we bring you a man hiding in a pot. Hilarious. All right, gather round, chuckleheads. Today's tale is a laugh riot fueled by desperation, good looks, and a car that runs hotter than a politician caught in a lie. Please wait until the end for the punchline. We got Edwin, whose car is about as useful as a chocolate teapot in the Sahara, and a woman who looks like she could sell ice cubes to Eskimos, but with a secret that screams trouble louder than a karaoke night gone horribly wrong. Hold on to your sides, history buffs, because we're about to take a detour that's more exciting than a tax audit with a missing receipt. Forget stocks. 17th century Holland went bulb berserk. Tulip mania swept the nation, with fortunes blooming and withering faster than a fickle flower. Fancy tulip bulbs, especially rare varieties with vibrant stripes and unusual speckles, became the new gold. People traded houses for single blooms, and everyone, from cobblers to cheesemakers, dreamt of riches blooming overnight. Enter the con artists, the Rembrandts of Ruse. These smooth talkers spun fantastical tales of mythical tulips. The nightingale's lament, they'd claim, only bloomed under a full moon serenaded by a lovesick nightingale and could fetch you a castle and a lifetime supply of cheese. Spoiler alert, no such nightingales existed and cheese prices stayed firmly Gouda. Blinded by greed and visions of easy money, people gobbled up these stories. Contracts for future delivery of these mythical bulbs flew faster than pigeons at a spilled seed market. They were essentially buying tulip-shaped air, completely oblivious. The whole market was a house of cards built on hot air and even hotter tulips. Eventually, someone, perhaps a particularly hungry nightingale, realized the emperor, or rather, the tulip market, had no clothes. Prices plummeted faster than a rogue wheel of cheese rolling downhill, and fortunes vanished overnight. The great Dutch tulip fiasco serves as a hilarious and slightly tragic reminder. Not everything shiny is a golden bulb. Don't believe smooth talkers, especially when they're selling flowers with suspiciously specific blooming requirements. After all, a bird in the hand or a wheel of cheese in the pantry is worth a field of imaginary tulips. Hold on to your sides, folks, because Buckle Up just ain't strong enough for this. We're about to launch ourselves into a con so audacious, so ridiculously brilliant, it'll have your funny bone begging for mercy. A man, let's call him Edwin, was driving through the Montana when his car sputtered like a politician caught in a lie detector test. Luckily, a farm loomed ahead like a mirage, and he swerved in desperate hope for some help. Pulling into the yard, he was greeted by a sight that would make a lesser man clutch his pearls. A scrawny man, as bare as a newborn baby on picture day, was busy hollowing out of a house with a look of intense concentration, like a squirrel frantically stockpiling nuts for the apocalypse climbed into a black soap pot. To add to the absurdity, the man seemed to be wife emerged from the house looking like a vision, enough to make a scarecrow question its sexuality. And just when you think things can't get any weirder, a beat-up backy pulls in, driven by a man who looked like he'd wrestled a herd of angry meerkats and lost. Edwin stammered out his car troubles to the uncle, hoping for a drop of water for his radiator that was hotter than his bank account after a weekend in Vegas. The uncle, bless his bewildered heart, offered a bucket with a wink and a... Sure thing, city slicker. Don't go spending it all in one place on fancy car coolant. During the water exchange, the conversation drifted, and the uncle, as curious as a goat with a lottery ticket, asked, So what brings you way out here anyway? The man puffed out his chest like a pigeon trying to impress a peacock. I, sir, am a con artist, top of the line. The farmer snorted, a sound suspiciously like a pig with hiccups. Con artist? That's just a fancy way of saying you nickel and dime folks for a living. Now real con artists? Those are the chaps in Weatherworld who promise 10 feet of rain in Montana with a sprinkle of magic dust. The man, determined to prove his point, 
grinned like a coyote who just outsmarted a rancher. Look here, uncle. See that black soap pot over there? I bet you five bucks I can make a whole man appear out of it with a little fire. Just light one under that bad boy, and presto, instant friend. The uncle snorts, laughter escaping like a donkey with hiccups. He builds the fire anyway, mostly because the idea of a magic man popping out of a soap pot is just too darn ridiculous to pass up. So there they stand, fire crackling, pot bubbling, when suddenly a bald dude leaps out and sprints off like a startled springbok. The uncle stares, jaw slack as a windsock in a hurricane. Finally, he scratches his head and mumbles, Well, I'll be a yellow-spotted dick-dick. If I didn't know better, I would have sworn that that man was our Reverend Nell. Now we bring you the last funny joke of the day. As promised, we believe we left the best for last. Once the joke are done and you liked this compilation, then subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon and you will be notified of our content. Now let's laugh. Forget Netflix and chill. In today's funny story joke, it's Bible stories and cackle. That's right, we're diving into the life of Delilah the OG hairstylist with a side hustle in betrayal. But before we spill the tea, or should I say Philistine wine, let's brush up on a little history that's more dramatic than your grandma's soap opera collection. So, there once was this dude named Samson. Think Popeye on steroids, the kind of guy who could floss his teeth with barbed wire. Now, Samson had a secret weapon, his hair. It wasn't like luscious locks flowing in the breeze, no, it was more like a giant hairy chia pet growing on his head. But hey, it held the key to his superhuman strength. So who was he to judge? Enter Delilah, a woman with a smile that could melt glaciers and a heart colder than a penguin's belly button. She was working for Samson's arch enemies, the Philistines, who saw Samson as a walking hairy wrecking ball to their sandcastle empires. Delilah set her sights on Samson batting her eyelashes like feathery windshield wipers. Samson, bless his naive heart, was smitten faster than a moth to a disco ball. Night after night, Delilah would ply Samson with compliments and gourmet protein shakes. Gotta keep those muscles fueled. All the while, she'd be casually dropping hints about his strength like, wow, Samson, you're so strong. Is it like a special hair gel you use? Samson, as dense as a brick, wrapped in another brick, never suspected a thing. Finally, after weeks of relentless eyelash batting and protein shakes, seriously, the man was starting to look like a walking protein bar. Delilah sprung the trap. She threw Samson a dinner party so lavish it made a Roman emperor blush. Wine flowed like a broken fire hydrant, and Samson, feeling a little woozy, thanks to a special protein shake, started spilling secrets like a leaky faucet. It's my hair, Delilah, Samson bellowed, dramatically pointing at his chia pet head. These luscious locks hold the key to my strength. Delilah, internally doing a victory dance that would make Beyonce jealous, feigned surprise. Oh, Samson, really? That's interesting, she said, her voice dripping with sugar and betrayal. Later that night, as Samson snored like a grizzly bear with a head cold, Delilah snuck in with a pair of rusty nail clippers she borrowed from the Philistine janitor. Let's just say those clippers weren't designed for industrial strength chia pet removal. It wasn't pretty, but with a few snips and a lot of sweat, Delilah relieved Samson of his hairy power source. The next morning, Samson woke up feeling like a deflated air mattress. He went to flex his biceps, but all he got was a pathetic wiggle. The Philistines stormed in, ready to capture their weakened foe. Samson, feeling like a fool who got outsmarted by a rusty nail clipper, could only stare in disbelief. But wait, just as the Philistines were about to haul him off, Delilah stepped forward. Oh, those silly Philistines, she scoffed. Don't they know real strength comes from the heart? Besides, she leaned in conspiratorially. Samson still has his eyebrows. 
Maybe that's where the real power lies? The Philistines, thoroughly confused and slightly terrified of a woman wielding rusty nail clippers, froze. Samson, catching on, winked at Delilah. Maybe she wasn't so bad after all. Maybe they could team up and create some real chaos for the Philistines. After all, who wouldn't underestimate a woman with a rusty nail clipper and a mischievous glint in her eye? All right, all right, history nap time is over. Those textbooks can go back to collecting dust next to Samson's hairpiece. Let's get down to brass tacks, or should I say, weave extensions, because this Delilah story is about to get wilder than a bad perm in a hurricane. In the quaint town of Hope Springs Eternal, the first church of perpetual bachelordom boasted the most devout congregation this side of the Mississippi. Their motto? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, especially if you're already married to her. Strict? Absolutely. But these men cherished their independence, their fishing buddies, and their Sunday morning potlucks, heavy on the sausage rolls. Then, disaster arrived in the form of a black-headed bombshell named Delilah. Think Jessica Rabbit meets Dolly Parton on a bender, heads swiveled faster than a sprinkler on high pressure. Delilah, bless her manipulative heart, batted her eyelashes with the grace of a hummingbird and purred like a kitten with a full belly of cream. Soon, divorce papers were flying faster than gossip at a bingo night. One by one, the once faithful filled the pews less and the offering plate more closely resembled a thimble. Pastor Miller, a man whose beard rivaled Moses, saw his congregation dwindle faster than a birthday cake at a toddler party. Panic bloomed on his rosy cheeks like a rogue tomato in his victory garden. Desperate times called for desperate measures. So, Pastor Miller, armed with a hymnal and a surprising amount of desperation, marched over to Delilah's doorstep. Now, the good pastor had never dealt with anything more flirtatious than a rogue squirrel after a donation of stale nuts. This was going to be interesting. The pastor and his chief elder are sent by the church council to visit Delilah in the congregation in an attempt to get her back on the narrow road. She has led many a brother into temptation so that he stumbles, falls, and remains lying. When they sat down across from her, it is clear that you have to be a strong man to understand this. Delilah. She has long, slender legs, and she wears such a short miniskirt that she could almost have left it on. Clearly, she has also worked on her assets because she is so witty that gravity has no hold on her at all. The elder tries to ignore it, but still the text from the Song of Songs comes to mind about the fat lambs that graze among the white lilies. As a mitigating circumstance, she at least has a pendant with an herb around her neck, but the herb plays hide-and-seek among those gooey lambs. The pastor notices his brother here beside him swallows nervously and stares at the woman, hypnotized like a little feeler by a cunning snake. Brother, are your eyes fixed on the cross? He admonished, I'm trying, Reverend, muttered the elder. But the two murderers on either side of the cross have me in their sights. <laughs> in our next funny story joke of the week, we bring you a funny story about a massive pothole. In today's funny story joke, brace yourself for an uproarious tale of comedy and misadventure. This story will have you doubled over with laughter as we follow the hilarious exploits of Kevin, a young Irishman, on his first day with a street repair gang in London. This joke delivers non-stop hilarity that will keep you chuckling all the way through. Kevin O'Malley, a strapping lad with a twinkle in his eye and a brogue thicker than pea soup, landed a coveted position, a spot on London's illustrious street repair crew. But before popping open a celebratory Guinness, he learned his first lesson. Coveted positions in London are coveted for a reason. You see, Kevin's crew wasn't just any crew. 
they were the elite squad tasked with a most unenviable mission, conquering the pothole of all potholes. This particular abyss, nestled in the heart of a central burrow, held the dubious honor of winning the most appalling, deepest, this will kill all cyclist, Pothole of the Year Award for a record-breaking two centuries. It was a title the borough wore with a peculiar pride, a badge of honor for their crumbling infrastructure. Now Kevin, fresh off the Emerald Isle, was about to learn the true meaning of British eccentricity. On a crisp Monday morning, Kevin arrived at the work site, brimming with youthful enthusiasm. He envisioned a flurry of activity, jackhammers pounding, asphalt smoking, a symphony of construction noises heralding the vanquishing of the dreaded pothole. Instead, he was greeted by a sight that made him question his sanity. A group of burly men, clad in high-vis jackets and grinning wider than Cheshire cats, were huddled around a huge pothole, fishing rods in hand. Their voices boomed in a cacophony of Irish jigs and off-key renditions of tales of a fisherman. Confused, Kevin scratched his head. Was this some bizarre London initiation ritual before sunrise? Curiosity gnawing at him, Kevin approached the merry band. As he neared, their song morphed into a boisterous Top, top of, of the morning, morning to ya! A sound that warmed him like a peat fire on a winter's night. It felt like a piece of home amidst the foreign bustle of London. Mustering his courage, Kevin tapped the shoulder of a man with a beard that rivaled Gandalf's. Excuse me, sir. My name is Kevin. I am starting work on this site today. May I ask, what are they doing? He inquired, masking his bewilderment with a friendly smile. Fishing? Stay tuned, because this funny story joke ain't over yet. There's more hilarity just around the corner. But why? And when are we going to start filling up the pothole? He inquires, still as puzzled as before. Well, we have been trying to do that for years, and it just keeps opening up. So we declared it a national tourist attraction and called it Lake Pothole. Fishing permits are available at the office for a fee. But why would anyone want to fish there? The foreman looks at him with a big grin. Well, so far this week, I caught six tires, seven rims, and a steering wheel. In our second funny story joke of the day, we bring you a guy that owns a bar. In today's funny story joke, we explore the comedic adventures of Jack, the longtime barman of Avalon. This story takes a hilarious turn one night when Jack, peacefully sleeping, is rudely awakened by a series of absurd phone calls. What unfolds is a comedy of errors that will have you laughing out loud. Join us for this uproarious tale about a bar, a barman, and one very funny persistent patron. In the quaint little town of Avalon, there was only one bar and one barman, Jack. Jack had owned this bar for quite some time, since he was 21 to be exact. Now at 62, he looked forward to the day he could retire and enjoy some well-earned rest. But until then, he was content with running the town's only watering hole, a beloved and somewhat notorious spot. One night around 11 o'clock, Jack was woken up from a deep, peaceful sleep by the ringing of his phone. Groggy and a bit annoyed, he picked up. Hello, can I help you? He mumbled. Oh, hello, sir. I just wanted to know how late the bar will be opening. A young man asked, remarkably calm for this hour. Jack, puzzled, replied, Well, sir, we open at nine o'clock in the morning and close at five in the evening. There was a pregnant pause. Then the young man responded. Well, thank you, sir. I guess I'll have to wait until then. Sorry for bothering you. See you tomorrow morning. Bye now. Jack thought it was odd, but shrugged it off and went back to sleep. 
At two o'clock in the morning, the phone rang again. Jack, still half asleep, answered. Hello, how may I help you? Hello there. I have a little question. How late will you be opening the... This time... The voice was slurred, clearly belonging to someone who had been drinking all night. Jack sighed and replied, Well, sir, we open at 9 o'clock in the morning and close at 5 o'clock in the evening. Well, I gotta wait still? Oof, okay, at least I have a way to skip time. Bye-bye now. Jack went back to bed, thinking about how strange the night had been. But this funny story joke ain't over just yet. Things are about to get even more twisty and hilarious. At 5 o'clock in the morning, Jack's phone rang once more. He picked it up, seriously considering throwing the phone out the window. Hello, this is Jack. How may I help you? He asked, trying to keep his composure. <laughs> How can you help me? Came a familiar drunken voice. Tell me, my friend. Tell me. How late does this little place of yours open? The yummy drinking place? Jack, now recognizing the voice, replied, Well, sir, we open at 9 o'clock and close at... Yeah, I know, I know, at 5 o'clock. Wow, sir, it's 5 a.m. and you're waiting for the bar to open already? Things must be pretty rough. But unfortunately, sir, you have to wait outside my bar until I open. <sighs> Till you open. The drunk man slurred. For your information, sir, I've been in one place since yesterday at 5 o'clock. I'm already in the bar. Can you please come and open your bar so that I can go home? Now, we bring you a funny story joke about a businessman who tried to do a deal with the Pope. In today's funny story joke, Prepare for an uproarious tale of marketing mishaps and divine negotiations. This comedy follows the hilarious journey of a fried chicken company owner as he tries to strike an unbelievable deal with the Pope. Get ready to laugh out loud as we dive into a story that's both funny and unforgettable. In a bustling city, a savvy entrepreneur named Henry ran the famous Henry's Fried Chicken. Known for its crispy golden chicken and secret blend of herbs and spices, the business had once enjoyed immense success. However, recent months had seen a decline in sales, and Henry was desperate to turn things around. He needed a marketing strategy that would catapult his company back to the top. One evening, while pondering over his dilemma, Henry had a light bulb moment. He thought, what if I could get the Vatican to mention my chicken in the Lord's Prayer? That would surely grab everyone's attention. With renewed enthusiasm, he decided to contact the Pope himself. After navigating through layers of Vatican officials, Henry finally managed to get a phone call with the Pope. Nervously, he presented his bold proposal. Your Holiness, Henry began. I am the owner of Henry's Fried Chicken, and I have a rather unique request. I would like you to change the words of the Lord's Prayer from give us this day our daily bread to give us this day our daily chicken. In return, I will donate $10 million to the Vatican. The Pope, taken aback by such an unconventional offer, responded kindly but firmly. I'm sorry, my son. It's the Lord's Prayer and I cannot change it. The words are sacred and have been passed down through generations. Disappointed but not discouraged, Henry thanked the Pope and hung up. A month passed, and sales continued to plummet. Desperation began to set in, and Henry decided to try his luck once more. Your Holiness, Henry pleaded during his second call. I really need your help. Sales are worse than ever. If you agree to my request, I will donate 50 million to the Vatican. The Pope sighed, recognizing the dire situation Henry was in. Your offer is very tempting, he admitted. The church could do a lot of good with that much money. It would help us to support many charities and initiatives. However, I must decline again. It is the Lord's Prayer, and I simply cannot change the words. Henry's hopes were dashed once more, and he hung up, 
feeling the weight of his company's future on his shoulders. Two more months dragged by, and Henry's situation grew increasingly dire. Sales had hit an all-time low, and he knew he had to make a final desperate attempt. Gathering every ounce of courage, Henry made one last call to the Vatican. Your Holiness, he said, his voice trembling. This is my final offer. If you change the Lord's Prayer for me, I will give 100 million to the Vatican. The Pope paused, considering the enormous sum. Let me get back to you. The Pope then convened an urgent meeting with his cardinals. They gathered in a grand hall, filled with ornate decorations and a sense of anticipation. The Pope addressed them solemnly. I have some good news and some bad news, he began. The good news is that a fried chicken company is going to donate $100 million to the Vatican. But that ain't just the end. This funny story's twist is about to get really twisty. A murmur of excitement rippled through the room. The Cardinals could already envision the numerous charitable projects and improvements this windfall could support. However, the Pope's expression turned sober as he continued. The bad news is that we have lost the bread account. In our fourth funny joke of week one, we bring you some priests with hilarious driving skills. In today's funny story joke, we take you on a journey with a group of monks on an educational visit to America. Their road trip quickly turns into a hilarious adventure, filled with comedy and unexpected twists. Get ready to laugh as you follow the monk's misadventures on the highways of the United States. This joke is packed with humor and clever twists that will have you laughing out loud. In the heart of rural Ireland, a small abbey decided it was time to send a group of monks to America for an educational and instructional visit. The chosen few, led by the amiable brother Patrick, were thrilled at the prospect of this grand adventure. With a bit of trepidation and a lot of excitement, they boarded their flight, eager to explore the vast lands of the United States. After a long journey, they landed in sunny California, where the roads seemed to stretch out endlessly. Renting a car, the monks embarked on their cross-country educational tour. Brother Patrick, the most experienced driver among them, took the wheel. His navigation skills, however, were perhaps not as sharp as his spiritual wisdom. As they cruised along the scenic highways, the monks marveled at the wide open spaces and the novelty of American road signs. Brother Patrick, ever the cautious driver, kept a steady pace, ensuring they adhered to all the traffic rules. The car, filled with chatter and laughter, moved at a leisurely speed, giving the monks ample time to take in the sights. But this funny story joke ain't over yet. One sunny afternoon, as they traveled along a particularly picturesque stretch of road, the monks noticed a police car trailing them. The flashing lights and blaring sirens soon signaled them to pull over. Brother Patrick, puzzled but compliant, eased the car to the shoulder of the highway. The police officer, a stout man with a no-nonsense demeanor, approached their vehicle. With a firm but courteous tone, he addressed Brother Patrick. Father, this is a 70 miles per hour highway. Why are you driving so slow? Brother Patrick, with a look of genuine confusion, replied, Sir, I saw a few signs that said 22, not 70. Suppressing a smile, the officer explained. Hey, oh, Father, that's not the speed limit. That's the name of the highway you are on. But say, you sound Irish, so if you are a visitor, I won't book you. My grandparents were Irish. Brother Patrick's face lit up with relief and a touch of embarrassment. Oh, how silly of me. Thanks for letting me know. But surely there is no limit on driving slowly in the U.S. The officer shrugged, a hint of amusement in his eyes. Well, you might get hit by some of these nuts, and it ain't safe. At this point, the officer glanced into the back seat and noticed the other monks. They were pale, eyes wide with fear, and clearly shaken. Curious, the officer asked. 
Excuse me, Father, what's wrong with your friends back there? They're trembling. With a wry smile and a glint of humor in his eyes, Brother Patrick answered. Well, officer, we just got off Highway 101. In our first funny story joke of the day, we bring you three lying miners looking for a job. In today's uproarious comedy story joke, we unravel a joke that's as amusing as a sitcom finale. This story isn't your average tale. It's a rib-tickling saga brimming with twists and turns that'll have you chuckling like a comedy special on Netflix. So settle in, get ready to laugh, and brace yourself for a humorous narrative that promises to keep you grinning from ear to ear. In a dusty corner of Nevada, nestled between the tumbleweeds of Eureka and the glowing lights of Tonopah, a trio of eager souls spotted a newspaper ad calling for miners. It was a call to adventure, a chance to turn dusty dreams into golden realities. With grit in their eyes and determination in their hearts, they packed their gear and hit the open road for their shot at mining glory. First up was a smooth-talking lad from Virginia City, known far and wide for his ability to spin a tail thicker than the pines in Tahoe. He swaggered into the interview room where a grizzled interviewer from Tonopah greeted him with a straight-shooting question. Ever worked in a mine? Absolutely. Our lad beamed confidently. I've spent my days digging deep in the mines around Eureka. The interviewer's brow furrowed, skepticism written across his face like graffiti on a ghost town wall. Eureka? Son, there's little more there than tumbleweeds and casinos. The mines, they're over in Tonopah. Crestfallen. Our lad shuffled out of the room, muttering to his mates. Note to self, Eureka ain't where the gold's at. Next in line was a sturdy fella from Elko, a man whose veins practically ran with desert sand and silver dust. You ever been underground? Queried the interviewer, eyes sharp as a knife in a poker game. You betcha. I've worked the shafts around Donopa. The Elko man declared proudly. Impressive. Nodded the interviewer, leaning in with a hint of intrigue. How deep did you go? With a glint in his eye, the Elko man replied, Oh, about 200 to 300 meters, I reckon. The interviewer's face darkened like a thundercloud over the Sierra Nevadas. Son, those mines plunge deeper than the Grand Canyon. You might want to recalibrate that claim. Disheartened, our Elko lad emerged from the interview room, shaking his head in disbelief. Remember, he cautioned his buddies. In Tonopah, they measure depths like they measure sunsets, long and deep. Last to strut into the room was a fella straight out of Goldfield, his grin as wide as Hoover Dam and a glimmer of hope shining brighter than Vegas lights. You ever dig for ore? Asked the interviewer, a hint of curiosity dancing in his weathered eyes. Sure have. Spent my days in Tonopah, digging deep, two to three kilometers deep. The Goldfield man replied with a confidence that echoed through the room. The interviewer perked up, impressed by the bold claim. All right, last question he said, leaning forward with a gleam of challenge. What type of headlamps did you use in the mine? The man scratched his head, considering his response carefully. A smile spread across his face as he chuckled softly. Well, sir, we don't need those we were strictly day shift kind of folk. <laughs> in our second funny story joke of the week, we bring you an angry mother. In today's funny story joke, prepare yourself for an uproarious tale of comedy and misadventure. This story will have you in fits of laughter as we follow the hilarious encounter of a female leprechaun and a bus driver. Get ready for a joke that's not just funny, but a comedy masterpiece that promises to keep you giggling all the way through. In the quaint town of Letterkenny, nestled among rolling green hills and babbling brooks, lived a feisty female leprechaun named Fiona. 
Fiona was known throughout the town for her quick wit, fiery temper, and her newborn baby boy, Joe. Little Joe was an unusual baby, even by leprechaun standards, with bright green hair that stood on end like a pot of shamrocks just after a good watering, and a mischievous glint in his emerald eyes. One sunny morning, brighter than a freshly polished pot of gold, Fiona decided to take Joe on a trip across town to visit her sister Moira. Moira, bless her nimble fingers, had promised to knit Joe a special leprechaun baby bonnet, complete with tiny shamrock ear flaps and a golden tassel that would jingle merrily with every kick little Joe gave. Fiona, with Joe nestled snugly in her sling, a repurposed rainbow that shimmered in the sunlight, made her way down the cobbled path towards the bus stop. The rhythmic click-clack of her tiny leather boots echoed against the stone, punctuated by the occasional gurgle from Joe, who seemed particularly interested in the world unfolding before him. A world filled with buzzing bumblebees, plump ladybugs, and the occasional grumpy badger waddling out for his morning constitutional. The bus soon arrived with a screech that could wake the dead, or at least a particularly lazy banshee, and a puff of exhaust that smelled suspiciously like burnt clover. The doors hissed open, revealing a cramped interior and a driver who looked like he'd been marinating in a vat of vinegar for far too long. His permanent scowl could sour a vat of the finest fermented leprechaun ale at 20 paces, and his bushy eyebrows seemed perpetually furrowed in a state of disapproval. Fiona, ever the picture of feisty confidence, marched onto the bus, her head held high. As she fished out her bus fare, a single, shimmering gold coin that winked mischievously in the dim light and handed it to the driver, the grumpy fellow glanced at Joe and let out a disdainful snort that could have cleared a room full of cobwebs. Ugh, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. He muttered loud enough for everyone to hear. Fiona's eyes widened in shock. Her cheeks flushed with anger, and she could feel steam practically coming out of her ears like a kettle about to whistle. Without a word, she stormed down the aisle, her tiny leprechaun feet stomping like a drum roll. She plopped into an empty seat with such force that the cushion squeaked in protest. She was seething with rage, her mind buzzing with a thousand comebacks. How dare that driver insult her precious Joe? The nerve. If she had magic on her side, she'd have turned him into a toadstool right then and there. But this funny story ain't over just yet, and Fiona's anger was just getting started. Her fury was boiling over like a pot of Irish stew left unattended. Sitting next to her was a kind-looking man with a twinkle in his eye, who noticed her distress. What's wrong? He asked, genuinely concerned. That driver just insulted me. Fiona fumed, her voice shaking with anger. The man raised an eyebrow and gave her a reassuring smile. You shouldn't take that. You tell him off. Go ahead. I'll hold your monkey. In our third funny story joke of the week, we bring you the secret to getting old. In today's funny story joke, prepare yourself for an uproarious tale of longevity, love, and laughter. This story will have you chuckling as we explore the hilarious secret behind an elderly couple's extraordinary health. Get ready for a joke that's not just funny, but a comedy masterpiece that promises to keep you giggling all the way through. Nestled amongst rolling green hills and babbling brooks lay the quaint village of Evergreen Creek. Here, time seemed to move at a gentler pace the only hustle and bustle reserved for the occasional squirrel scampering for acorns. But amidst the serene meadows and cobbled streets resided a couple who defied all logic, William and Martha Buttercup. William, a spry 102-year-old with a shock of white hair that defied gravity, and Martha, a radiant 98 with a smile that could melt glaciers, were the talk of the town. 
Their secret? Not some miracle potion or a pact with a mischievous leprechaun. No, the source of their youthful vigor was a tale so hilariously eccentric it could make a grumpy badger chuckle. One sunny afternoon, a curious tourist named Harold wandered into Evergreen Creek. He'd heard whispers of the sprightly centenarians and was determined to unravel their secret. He found William chopping firewood, his shirt sculpted to an enviable physique by a lifetime of hard work. Beads of sweat glistened on his brow, but his movements were as smooth as a seasoned lumberjack half his age. Harold, a portly man with a penchant for pastries, approached William cautiously. Excuse me, sir. I couldn't help but notice your remarkable energy. Are you the guy they are talking about that is 102 years old? William, with a twinkle in his eye, chuckled. That's precisely the number, young fellow. That might be a bit of a stretch for you. Harold, momentarily stung but determined, continued. Wow. Well, you look amazing. What's your secret? William, wiping his brow with the back of his hand, winked. Ah, well, that's a story for another time. Perhaps you'd like to help me carry this load inside. A bit heavy for these old bones, you see. Harold, eager to unlock the secret to eternal youth, or at least a slightly less winded climb to his third floor apartment, readily agreed. They hoisted the wood and headed towards a charming cottage nestled amongst blooming roses. Inside, William settled into a rocking chair, the worn leather creaking a gentle welcome. Now, where were we? Ah, uh, yes, the secret to my, shall we say, sprightly demeanor? Harold leaned forward, practically vibrating with anticipation. Yes, yes, please tell me. William chuckled again, a rich rumbling sound like distant thunder is. You see, young fellow, Martha and I have been married for 75 years. Now we have our disagreements like any couple, of course. But instead of sulking or shouting, we made a little pact. Harold, captivated, nodded eagerly. Every time we have an argument, William continued, a sly grin spreading across his face. The loser, the one who started the squabble, must run five kilometers. Harold's eyes widened. Five kilometers? Every time they argued? The man must be a marathon champion. But... William continued, noticing Harold's bewildered expression. Seeing as we have a fairly lively marriage, and I am usually the one starting the argument... William grinning. I've been running those five kilometers almost every single day for 75 years. But this funny story is not just over yet. Harold's jaw nearly hit the floor. No wonder William looked like he could wrestle a bear. But then, a niggling thought arose. But if that's the case... Harold stammered. How come your wife, Martha, is in such incredible shape too? William's smile widened into a mischievous grin. Well, he said, a mischievous glint in his eye. She usually runs after me with a rolling pin, hollering for me to pick up the pace and finish those five kilometers. In our fourth funny story joke of the week, we bring you a priest and a nun having to share a room for the night. In today's funny story joke, we travel to the quaint village of Ballymore, nestled between rolling green hills, where two dedicated souls, Father Patrick and Sister Mary, found themselves in an uproarious situation. After a long day at the seminary, their car broke down, leading to an unforgettable night filled with comedy. Get ready for a hilarious twist that will have you laughing out loud. In the quaint, sleepy village of Ballymore, nestled between rolling hills and ancient trees, a priest named Father Patrick and a nun named Sister Mary were returning from a long day at the seminary. The sky was beginning to darken, and a gentle mist was rising from the fields, giving the landscape an ethereal glow. 
As they drove along the winding country road, the car began to sputter and cough, finally giving out altogether. Father Patrick sighed and pulled the car to the side of the road. Well, sister, it looks like we're stranded until morning. The nearest garage won't open until then. Sister Mary nodded, her eyes scanning the darkening horizon. It seems we'll need to find a place to stay for the night. After a short walk, they found a cozy little bed and breakfast, its windows glowing warmly in the evening light. The sign read, The Restful Haven, and it looked like the perfect place to spend the night. They approached the innkeeper, an elderly woman with a kind smile, who informed them that only one room was available. Father Patrick and Sister Mary exchanged a glance, both thinking the same thing. This would be an interesting night. Father Patrick hesitated for a moment before saying, Sister, I don't think the Lord would object if we spent the night sharing this one room. I'll sleep on the sofa and you can have the bed. Sister Mary considered this and then agreed. I think that would be fine, Father. They prepared for bed, each saying their nightly prayers with the solemnity befitting their station, though the absurdity of the situation wasn't lost on either of them. The room was small but comfortable, with a single bed that looked like it had seen better days and a modest sofa that seemed to have a slight tilt to one side. Father Patrick, ever the gentleman, insisted on taking the sofa. As he stretched out on it, the sofa let out a groan louder than an old church organ. It creaked and squeaked with every minor adjustment he made, sounding almost as if it were giving a running commentary on his every move. He finally found a position that seemed somewhat stable and let out a sigh of relief, which was immediately followed by another loud creak from the sofa, as if in response. Sister Mary, on the other hand, settled into the bed, pulling the covers up to her chin with a shiver. She glanced over at Father Patrick, who was still wrestling with the rebellious sofa, and couldn't help but smile. The bed was cozy enough, though it had a slight dip in the middle that made her feel like she was being gently folded in half. They exchanged a look across the room, the kind that old friends share when they're both in on the funny joke, and each tried to stifle their giggles. The bed and the sofa seemed to be in a contest of which could make the most noise, and it was a close race. Ten minutes passed, and Sister Mary whispered into the darkness, Father, I'm very cold. Father Patrick, ever the gentleman, replied, It's okay, sister. I'll get a blanket from the cupboard. He got up, fetched a blanket, and gently laid it over her. Another ten minutes passed, and Sister Mary spoke again. Father, I'm still terribly cold. Father Patrick sighed but remained patient. Don't worry, sister. I'll get up and fetch you another blanket. He got up once more, retrieved another blanket from the cupboard, and placed it over her. But hold on there, as this funny story joke ain't over just yet. Another ten minutes went by, and the room was filled with a heavy silence, save for the occasional rustle of the blankets. Then, in a voice barely above a whisper, Sister Mary murmured, Father, I'm still very cold. I don't think the Lord would mind if we acted as man and wife just for this one night. Father Patrick was silent for a moment, his mind racing with the implications of her suggestion. Then, with a twinkle of mischief in his eye, he replied, You're right, sister. Get your own blankets. <laughs> in our last funny story joke of the week, we bring you two young priests having to paint a room. But before... In today's funny story joke, prepare yourself for an uproarious tale of comedy and misadventure. This story will have you in fits of laughter as we follow the hilarious predicament of two new priests given an unusual task by their chief priest. Get ready for a joke that's not just funny, but a comedy masterpiece that promises to keep you giggling all the way through. In the heart of America, nestled among towering oak trees and lush green fields, lay the esteemed St. Benedict's Seminary. 
This grand institution was renowned for its rigorous training and the peculiar sense of humor of its chief priest, Father O'Malley. Fresh off the bus from their small hometowns, two eager new priests, Father Tom and Father Mike, found themselves standing before Father O'Malley, who had a twinkle of mischief in his eye. Welcome to St. Benedict's, gentlemen. Father O'Malley greeted them. Your first task is a simple one. Paint your room. But there's a catch. You must do it without getting a single drop of paint on your clothes. Father Tom and Father Mike exchanged puzzled glances. How were they supposed to accomplish such a feat? After a moment of thought, Father Tom's eyes lit up with a spark of inspiration. Hey, let's take all our clothes off, fold them up and lock the door. Father Tom suggested with a grin. Father Mike hesitated, but the logic was sound. With no clothes, there would be no risk of getting paint on them. So, with a mix of excitement and nervous laughter, they stripped down, folded their clothes neatly in the corner, and locked the door. Naked as the day they were born, they picked up their paintbrushes and got to work. Father Timothy, usually stoic, did a jig that would shame a leprechaun, paintbrush in hand. Father Bartholomew, ever the joker, hummed a hilariously off-key tune, occasionally flicking paint at Timothy with the precision of a drunken squirrel. Their laughter echoed through the halls, transforming the once quiet seminary into a monastery of mirth. The room, once a beige wasteland, morphed into a vibrant blue canvas under their questionable artistic touch. Father Timothy attempted a fresco, but his creation resembled a toddler's finger painting project more than Michelangelo's masterpiece. Father Bartholomew, seizing the opportunity for mischief, added a bushy mustache to a portrait of a stern-faced priest, sending them both into a fit of giggles so violent they nearly choked on their laughter. But this funny story joke ain't over yet. Just as they were finishing the final touches, there was a loud knock at the door. Both priests froze, their hearts pounding in their chests. Who is it? Father Mike called out, trying to keep his voice steady. Blind woman! came the reply from the other side of the door. The priests exchanged bewildered looks. A blind woman? What were the odds? Father Tom shrugged and said, She's blind, she can't see. What could it hurt? Reluctantly, they unlocked the door and let her in. The woman stepped into the room, tapping her cane lightly on the floor. She was petite, with a kind face framed by silver hair, and she moved with a confident grace that belied her blindness. Good afternoon, fathers. She greeted them cheerfully. Nice pecs. Where do you want me to hang the blinds? <laughs> In our first joke of the day, we bring you a 70 years old man with a young bride who still want a lot of children. Love after 60? Absolutely. At least that's what David, a man with a story to tell, and maybe a pacemaker, and his stunning wife Tiffany believe. In today's cartoon story joke, their whirlwind romance took a delightful turn just a year in, and let's just say David was feeling like he could conquer anything. But can this playful confidence in his own engine keep up with the demands of a growing family? Buckle up for a hilarious look at a marriage that proves age ain't nothing but a number with a few cheeky mechanical metaphors thrown in for good measure. A 70-year-old whirlwind named David, with a pacemaker that hummed a suspiciously jaunty tune, married the stunning Tiffany, a woman young enough to be his granddaughter, but with much better taste in men, obviously. Their whirlwind romance culminated a year later in the delivery room, where David was bouncing around like a toddler hopped up on pixie sticks, he looked like he could have bench-pressed the entire medical staff. Let's just say, fatherhood was probably less of a marathon and more of a victory lap for David at that point. A few pushes later, and a healthy, 3.5 kilos baby boy arrived, the picture of perfect health. The exhausted but ecstatic nurse approached David, ready to offer some congratulatory words. So, Mr. Johnson, is this little bundle of joy yours? Oh, you bet he is. 
And yep, this engine of mine is still working. I mean, look at him. Two years zipped by faster than David on a new scooter with a nitro boost. Doctors strongly advised against it. But hey, the man craved a little speed. Now sporting a permanent cane that coordinated surprisingly well with his collection of novelty socks, think flamingos and spaceships, David found himself back in the familiar territory of the maternity ward, alongside the ever-radiant Tiffany. Another healthy 3.5-kilometer bundle of joy, this time a beautiful baby girl arrived, letting out a lung-powered scream that could have rivaled a Harley Davidson revving its engine. The familiar nurse, Abby, with a knowing smile that could curdle milk, glanced at David, her eyebrows raised higher than a surprise disco dancer. Another winner of yours, Mr. Johnson? Oh, yes, ma'am. This engine of mine is still working and purring like a kitten. Two more years sped by like a greased pig at a county fair. David still had a scar from that unfortunate incident, bless his heart. Now sporting a hearing aid that whistled feedback whenever a particularly enthusiastic toddler shrieked and a cane that doubled as a handy back scratcher, David found himself back in the increasingly familiar delivery room. This time, however, the room wasn't filled with the sterile scent of newborns and nervous anticipation. No, this time it was a full-on toddler tornado, a rambunctious 3.5-year-old ball of energy with eyes that mirrored Tiffany's and a mischievous grin that could only belong to David. Because, let's face it, the kid had somehow figured out how to operate the vending machine in the waiting room, a feat that even David, in his younger days, wouldn't have dared to attempt. The familiar nurse, Abby, with a look that could melt steel and possibly diagnose a broken toe from across the room, glanced at David, a single eyebrow raised higher than a confused showgirl. Is this one yours, Mr. Johnson? But this nurse was clearly worried about Mr. Johnson's stamina. But you know he is now a 75-year-old man, so his engine is purring more smoke than anything else. So she pushed her thought aside, especially when she saw David beaming with pride. Sure is. This old engine's still running strong. The nurse, bless her ever-observant heart, was practically a fixture in the maternity ward at this point. She could identify a first-time dad from a seasoned pro just by the sweat on their brow, or, in David's case, the suspicious gleam of worry hiding behind his new bifocals. This time, however, her gaze lingered a beat too long on David. Maybe it was the fact that his cane seemed to be doing double duty as a walker now. Or perhaps it was the hearing aid whistling a jaunty tune that clashed spectacularly with the beeping of the nearby heart monitor. Whatever it was, Nurse Abby puffed out her chest, a woman on a mission. This wasn't just about offering congratulations anymore. This was an intervention. Well, Mr. Johnson, you may want to change that oil of yours. This one burnt more fuel and came out black. <laughs> In our second joke of the day, we bring you a husband that is sure that his wife is having an affair. In today's cartoon story joke, buckle up for a high-rise homicide. A jealous husband gets the shock of his life, leading to a chain reaction of chaos that will leave you hanging, literally. But fear not, there's a laugh, or two, or ten, to be found in this story that takes a hilarious nosedive from suspicion to the pearly gates. There was a businessman, let's call him Harold, who was sure that his wife, Beatrice, was cheating on him, so he put her under surveillance. One day at work, he got a call that told him to rush home quickly and he would be able to catch her in the act. So he rushed home to his 20th floor high-rise apartment and burst into the room. His wife was there, but he didn't see anyone else. Where is he, huh? Where is who? Harold, fueled by a jealous rage that would make a bull see red, tore through the apartment like a hurricane searching for a misplaced sock. First, he flung open the bedroom door, expecting to find a scene straight out of a romance novel. Instead, 
he was greeted by the serene sight of his wife curled up on the chaise longue, reading a book about the mating habits of the Patagonian Mara. Disappointment clawed at him, but his suspicion remained undeterred. He lunged towards the bed, yanking the covers back with enough force to launch a dust bunny into orbit. Nothing. Next, he dropped to his knees and peered under the bed, squinting into the shadowy abyss. All he found was a rogue sock and a colony of dust mites having a rave. Frustration bubbled over, turning his face a shade of purple that would make Barney the dinosaur jealous. Where are you hiding him, Beatrice? In the closet with your skeletons? He flung open every closet door with a flourish, expecting to find a secret room or a hidden passage. Instead, he was met with a disorganized collection of clothes, mismatched shoes, and a moth infestation that would make a fashion designer weep. Just as Harold was about to admit defeat, a faint sound reached his ears. It was a muffled whimper, like a cornered rodent, coming from the balcony. With renewed vigor, Harold stormed out onto the balcony, ready to confront his wife's supposed paramour. But the sight that greeted him wasn't what he expected. There, dangling precariously from the railing, his fingers desperately gripping the metal, was a man in a bright orange jazzer-sized leotard. Harold's jaw dropped faster than a mime impersonating a skydiver. Uh, what in the world are you doing? Help! I was just doing my jazzercise routine and, well, I kind of lost my balance. Harold blinked, processing this bizarre turn of events. Here he was, expecting to catch his wife cheating. And instead, he found a man clinging to his balcony for dear life, dressed like a creamsicle gone wrong. His initial rage morphed into a kind of bewildered amusement. Right, because jazzercise is known for its balcony balancing exercises. Are you sure you're not here for something else, like delivering surprise flowers to my wife? Dude, I wouldn't even know your wife if she walked past me wearing a neon sign that said, free hugs. Just please help me up. So Harold decided that is time to learn this man a lesson. So he went to go and get a hammer. He then began hitting the man's fingers and watched triumphantly as the man fell 20 stories. But to his dismay, the man fell into a bush Although badly injured, he wasn't dead. The businessman was livid. He went into his kitchen and rolled his refrigerator out to the balcony. He heaved it over the edge and watched with glee as the refrigerator landed on the injured man, killing him. The businessman started to laugh, but mid-laugh grabbed his chest and died from a massive heart attack. The businessman found himself in line before the pearly gates. St. Peter was there and it was clear that there was a delay. St. Peter said, I'm sorry, but heaven is full today. We're only letting in folks who have died in a very stressful way. Well, I died today, full of stress. Really, do tell. So, the businessman related the above story. St. Peter was swayed. Really, do tell. The next guy in line stepped up. St. Peter told him the same thing. Did you die in a stressful way? Did I? And how? I was doing my jazzercise tape in my living room on the 21st floor of my high-rise apartment when I kind of lost track of where I was. I accidentally fell off my balcony and was plummeting to my sure death when miraculously I was able to grab onto the balcony below mine. I was hanging on but just barely when a man came out. Thank God I thought, I'm saved. But to my horror, he started stomping on my fingers. It hurt terribly, but I was able to hang on. Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, he stopped and went back inside. Thank God, I thought. But just then, he comes back out with a hammer and starts to hammer my fingers. Well, I had to let go, and I fell into a bush. Although badly injured, I was still alive, and I was just about to yell for help when I looked up just in time to see a refrigerator heading right for me. And the next thing I know, I'm here. St. Peter's mouth was hanging open. All he could do was gesture the man inside and whisper, Go on, in. After a few moments to collect himself, St. Peter said, Next. The next guy steps up and after being told the condition for entry, 
St. Peter asks, Did you die stressfully? Yes, I did. And here's my story. I was hiding in this refrigerator from a very mad husband and... <laughs> In this third story joke of the day, we bring you a very beautiful blonde that have a plan with the police officers. Buckle up, folks, for a laugh that's faster than a speeding sports car and a blonde that's blonder than a bottle of bleat. In today's cartoon story joke, we've got an Officer O'Malley on a routine patrol who pulled over, wait for it, a gorgeous blonde with a lead foot and a memory like a faulty flip phone. Let's see how this traffic stop goes sideways, faster than a runaway shopping cart. Officer O'Malley, a man whose dating life resembled a tumbleweed in a ghost town, was having a day that could only be described as interesting. He was writing a particularly scathing parking ticket for a pigeon, don't ask, when a cherry red Ferrari screeched past him like a runaway shopping cart full of kittens. O'Malley, heart doing a tap dance in his chest, whipped a U-turn and pulled over the culprit. As he approached the car, his eyes did a double take. Behind the wheel sat a vision, a blonde with hair that would make a highlighter jealous and eyes the color of the Caribbean on a good day. This wasn't your average traffic stop. This was O'Malley facing his kryptonite. Beauty and well, the distinct possibility this woman might not know the difference between a gas pedal and a brake. I've pulled you over for speeding, ma'am. Can I see your driver's license? Sorry, officer, but what is a driver's license? Officer O'Malley thought to himself, how can a pretty woman be so clueless? I mean, not knowing what a driver's license is. You know the small card, looking like a credit card? It has a photo of you on it and is usually found in your wallet. Officer O'Malley, a man whose patience wore thinner than a disco shirt in the 80s, was starting to tap his foot. The blonde rummaged through her purse like a squirrel searching for the last acorn of autumn, finally unearthing a plastic rectangle that vaguely resembled a driver's license. Here you go. No, ma'am, may I please see your registration? Um, registration? What's that? It's usually in U-glove compartment. Officer O'Malley, whose patience had already reached the single-ply stage, was starting to suspect this interaction would be filed under learning experiences that make you question your career choice. The blonde, after what seemed like an archaeological dig through her purse, finally produced a crumpled piece of paper. Is this it? She chirped, holding it up with the triumphant air of someone who'd discovered a hidden continent made entirely of chocolate. O'Malley, Fearing the document might be a grocery list or a crayon drawing of a unicorn, braced himself for the next round of bewilderment. I'll be back in a minute. The officer walked back to his car and called into a dispatcher to run a check on the woman driver's license and registration. After a pregnant pause, the dispatcher came back. Um, is this woman driving a red sports car and a drop-dead gorgeous blonde? Um, yes, how did you know? Well, officer, this woman is known for speeding, and when she is pulled over, she somehow managed to get away without any warning or fine. Ah, uh, I see. I wonder how that happens. No one knows, officer, but here is something you can do. Give her her stuff back and drop your pants just like that in front of her. Well, I can't do that. It's inappropriate. The officer was shocked. I mean, he can't do that. Trust me, just do it. The dispatcher on the other end, well, let's just say his name was Dennis, and his idea of a good time involved embarrassing others and questionable dating app profiles. He pictured Officer McHotty fumbling with his pants like a confused penguin trying to put on a tuxedo. A glint lit up Dennis's eyes, a glint that could only mean one thing, Operation Hilarious. Traffic stop was a go. The officer returned to the blonde and gave her her license and registration back, and with a big breath in, he dropped his pants. The officer just stood there, pants down and all, and looked at the blonde. The blonde just looked down and said, Oh no, not another breathalyzer. <laughs> In 
In our fourth joke of the day, we bring you a culture clash. This Chinese man has an introduction to the USA. Ever wonder how different America is from, say, China? Well, buckle up, folks, because in today's cartoon story joke, we're taking a hilarious trip across the Pacific with a very confused Chinese tourist. Hold on to your chopsticks and buckle up your cowboy boots, folks. We're about to dive into a hilarious clash of cultures, a comical yin and yang of two great nations. It'll be like a fortune cookie with a side of apple pie, or a kung fu panda doing the macarena. Get ready to chuckle your way through this international showdown. Picture Uncle Sam's grumpy old uncle, Phil, in the USA. Perched on the flagpole like a feathered judge, he squints at the tourists below. Tourists? More like crumb droppers, he mutters, glaring at a rogue pigeon making off with his breakfast bagel. Bald is beautiful, but it don't fill the belly. While in China, across the Pacific, Ping the Panda flops back in his bamboo forest armchair, leaves sticking out of his mouth like overgrown broccoli. Ugh, another day, another ton of bamboo, he groans dramatically to his pal Lee. Lee, my dude, is there, like, anything else to eat in this country? Lee, another panda with a permanent case of the munchies, just shrugs and stuffs another stalk in his mouth. Nope, just bamboo. Glorious, glorious bamboo. Now in the USA, they drink coffee to stay awake if we need to work long hours. In China, just an afternoon nap will be good enough. Yes, it's coffee jitters versus afternoon zzz. In the USA, Marvin the mailman resembled a hummingbird hopped up on Red Bull. By 9 a.m., his third cup of coffee had him jittery enough to juggle mail sacks blindfolded. Gotta deliver the mail before I see squirrels, he shrieked, his voice two octaves higher than usual. Meanwhile, in China, May the office worker announced, power nap commencing with the authority of a queen. Her colleagues, veterans of the siesta wars, simply nodded and dimmed the lights. As May began a symphony of gentle snores, a co-worker tiptoed in and tucked a fluffy panda plushie under her chin. Shh, he whispered, don't wake the productivity panda. In the USA, a businessman named Brad, with a handshake so firm it could crack walnuts, approached his Chinese counterpart. Brad Smith, a pleasure to do business, he boomed. While in China, Mr. Li, a man whose handshake resembled a gentle wave, blinked in surprise. Greetings, Mr. Smith, but have you considered breakfast? A man cannot negotiate on an empty stomach, you know. Brad, confused, stammered. Uh, bagel? And some worries about the future of mankind? Mr. Lee's eyes widened. The future of mankind? Sounds heavy. Perhaps some dim sum will lighten your spirits. In the land of hot dogs and home runs, Larry the baseball player resembled a sleepwalker in cleats. Huh? What inning is it? He mumbled as the umpire yelled, Strike three! Across the Pacific, in the land of dumplings and lightning reflexes, Wei the ping-pong player was a blur of ferocious grunts and backhand smashes. His victory dance involved more flips than a celebratory pancake and enough noise to wake the Great Wall of China. In the USA, Brenda the Ice Queen chugged a gallon of ice water like she was auditioning for a polar bear documentary. Brain freeze for peak performance, she declared, sending confused shivers down the spines of nearby sunbathers. Meanwhile in China, Mr. Wang cradled his thermos of steaming hot water like a precious dragon egg. Ah, he sighed, cures what ails you except maybe the chills from watching American baseball players move that slow. In the USA, our family purr is a dog, but in China, a fish is more the norm. Imagine Chester the Chihuahua strutted down the sidewalk in a sequined dog sweater, shivering dramatically. This leash is a disgrace to canine fashion, he declared, glaring at his owner. Meanwhile, Mr. Chen proudly showed off his prize-winning goldfish in a tank adorned with miniature castles and plastic mermaids. Isn't he magnificent? He beamed, the envy of the entire neighborhood. 
Now that we've explored these cultural quirks like tourists peeking into a piñata full of surprises, let's dive into a joke that perfectly captures the hilarious clash. Get ready to snort out your bubble tea or choke on your donut, because here it comes. Meet Wei. First time in the land of the free and the home of... Well, Wei wasn't quite sure yet. He hailed a cab, ready to explore, and bam, first culture clash. Whoa, those buses are noisy and so slow. Back home, they're zipping around like bullet trains. Tony, the taxi driver, a man who'd seen enough tourists to fill the Statue of Liberty with selfie sticks, just shrugged. This new guy, Wei, was practically a walking comparison app. Those pigeons? Practically trained ninjas compared to the ones back home. So, when Wei spotted a couple of lumbering Navy ships in the distance, Tony braced himself. Sure enough, Wei leaned forward, eyes wide. Wow, those boats are slow. Back in China, our noodles move faster. Tony choked back a laugh, picturing a blur of ramen racing across the Pacific. This tourist was a gold mine. Seriously? Even the boats here are slow. China's got speed demons on the water. Wei, a tourist with the narration skills of a broken karaoke machine, finally reached his hotel. One look at the taxi meter and his jaw hit the floor faster than a dropped dumpling. The close-up on the meter revealed a price tag more suited to a spaceship ride. Narrator, dry as a fortune cookie with a bad review, Looks like Wei's gonna need some serious noodle negotiation skills for this one. You got to be kidding me! Those buses are snails! The boats are sloth mobiles! So how come your meter runs faster than a Beijing bullet train? Tony leans back in his seat, finally cracks a smile. My friend, it's made in China. In this last story joke of the day, we bring you a story about divorce and a mother-in-law. All right, all right, hold on to your dentures, folks. In today's cartoon story joke, we're about to unleash a barrage of mother-in-law jokes that would make even the Sphinx groan. But hold your horses, or should I say, rocking chairs. Before we unleash this comedic avalanche, let's take a teeny tiny detour through history. It'll be quicker than your mother-in-law can guilt trip you into baking a pie, I promise. Let's start with the first oops, I married twice divorce. Back in the 1640s, divorce was about as common as finding a comfortable pair of jeans. You pretty much had to have a spouse with two heads, or maybe two wives like our guy in this story, to get a judge to break things off. This particular fellow, let's call him Henry, because that was a popular name back then, and because it sounds kind of stuffy, accidentally ended up married to two different women at the same time. Talk about a scheduling conflict. Let's just say his social calendar was a mess. Then there is the rise of the six-week vacation, divorce fast forward a few centuries, and people were itching to get out of unhappy marriages faster than a mime at a noisy party. Enter Reno, Nevada. Back then, Reno wasn't the glitzy Vegas we know today. It was more like a sleepy desert town with tumbleweeds and tumbleweeds of boredom. But then someone had a genius idea. Hey, why not make it super easy to get a divorce here? Thus began the era of the divorce ranch. These weren't your typical dude ranches with horses and lassos. These were all-inclusive resorts for folks who wanted to ditch their spouse faster than a bad toupee in a windstorm. You could relax by the pool, listen to lectures on the art of not so grieving your ex, and find yourself a new beau, or boo, as they probably called it back then, all within six short weeks. It was like a singles vacation, but with more lawyers and way fewer flamingos. Then there is the no fault here, except maybe my taste in partners. Divorce. Finally, in the groovy 1960s, things got a little less dramatic. Divorce laws loosened up, and people could finally split because they just weren't feeling the love anymore, not because someone forgot to take out the trash, 
Although, let's be honest, that's a pretty good reason too. This led to a boom in divorces, but also a sigh of relief from folks who were stuck in marriages about as exciting as watching paint dry. Next, there is the DIY divorce because lawyers cost more than my wedding ring era. And then came the internet. Now you could download divorce forms faster than you could say irreconcilable differences. No more fancy lawyers with their big fees. People could become their own divorce DJs, spinning the tunes of freedom at a fraction of the cost. So, that's the history of divorce in a nutshell, or maybe a pistachio shell because that's a funny image. It's a story of changing times, loosening laws, and the ever-present human desire to find happiness, even if it means saying I don't, twice, or more. All right, all right, enough with the sad trombone sound effects. We all know Liam's love life is a dumpster fire right now, but who needs a downer on a Friday night? Let's skip the pity party and fast forward to the good stuff, the laugh a minute portion of the evening. Buckle up folks, because the joke and the reason for Liam's misery all boils down to one legendary figure, Mildred, Brenda's mother. It was a Friday night and the air crackled with the sweet scent of freedom. Or maybe that was just Liam's overflowing ashtray. Our man Liam looked like he'd been tangoed with by a particularly aggressive cactus. He slumped into his favorite armchair with a sigh that could deflate a blimp, narrowly missing a half-eaten bag of Funyuns. Across from him sat Rick, his best free and since they were both convinced they could fly by jumping off the roof with bedsheets. Spoiler alert, they couldn't. Rick, ever the optimist, race it an eyebrow. Rough day, mate? Still dealing with the whole Brenda situation? Dealing? Rick, this isn't dealing with a flat tire. This is a full-on marital meltdown, a Category 5 hurricane of emotions. Spill the beans, Liam. Did Brenda find your hidden stash of vintage Star Wars action figures again? You know how possessive she gets about Chewbacca. Far worse, Rick. Far worse. It's her mother, Mildred. Ah, Mildred. The woman who could make Mother Teresa question her faith in humanity. Brenda's a lovely lass, but her mom... Well, let's just say Attila the Hun had better table manners. You don't understand, Rick. The woman could turn sunshine into a guilt trip faster than you can say passive-aggressive casserole. Every visit was an emotional obstacle course. Liam, she'd coo, those jeans seem a tad snug around the midsection. Or, Brenda darling, have you considered a color palette that doesn't clash with your complexion? Sounds rough, buddy. But hold on, why blame Mildred for the divorce? Liam leans in, eyes gleaming like a mischievous chipmunk who just discovered a forgotten bag of fun yuns. Now listen here, Rick. When a relationship goes south, don't just blame the wife. It takes two to tango, you see? Blame her mom as well. <laughs> Story joke of the day. We bring you Farmer Jack visiting town. It's truly a jittery journey. In today's how the heck am I gonna get out of this one story? We meet Jack, a farmer whose tractor sounds more like a bag of angry cats than a well-oiled machine. Now, Jack's a good man, the salt of the earth type, but his mechanical skills are about as useful as a chocolate teapot in a dust storm. So, here's Jack, stranded in the middle of nowhere, with a broken tractor and a cell phone that only gets reception when there's a full moon and Jupiter aligns with Saturn. Will Jack use his ingenuity and farming know-how to fix the beast? Or will he be forced to resort to slightly less conventional methods, like offering Betsy the cow a very tempting trade involving alfalfa and a slightly used jalopy? Buckle up because this hilarious tale is about to get moving. Agriculture, the backbone of civilization. You know, the reason you don't have to hunt mammoths for dinner anymore. It all started simple. A stick, a seed, a whole lot of hope and backaches. Fast forward a few millennia, and we've got tractors that steer themselves, genetically modified crops that practically grow themselves, and enough automation to make R2-D2 look like a wind-up toy. But let's not get ahead of our mechanical chickens just yet. There was a time, not too long ago, well, maybe a couple generations, where farming was a symphony of sweat, ingenuity, and sheer cussed determination. 
Our farmers weren't just growing food, they were wrangling nature itself. Picture this, sun beating down on your neck, dust devils dancing across the horizon, and the only air conditioner you've got is the occasional rogue gust of wind. These folks knew every inch of their land, the whispers of the soil, the language of the clouds. They could coax a watermelon out of a desert with a rusty spoon and a kind word. Now, these farmers weren't exactly social butterflies. Their days were filled with the rhythmic clatter of farm equipment, the mooing of contented cows, well, maybe not that contented, and the squawking symphony of a particularly irate rooster who lost a fight to a particularly fluffy pancake. Town? Town was a mythical place whispered about on long winter nights, a land paved with something other than dirt, a place where things were bought, not bartered for with a jar of your grandma's secret pickles. So, when our farmer Jack, a man whose handshake could snap a cow femur and whose beard could house a family of field mice, announced he was heading into town, it was cause for a county-wide celebration. Now Jack's trips to town were legendary, not for their frequency, mind you, but for the sheer, chaotic, side-splitting absurdity that invariably followed. This Tuesday, however, promised a whole new level of mayhem. See, Jack's pickup were his main concern and needed some mechanical tender love and care. Mike, the town mechanic, was needed to put things straight again. Thus, with a determined glint in his eye, a slightly moth-eaten straw hat perched on his head and a shopping list scribbled on a feed sack, because apparently paper was a luxury reserved for city folk, Jack set off for the uncharted territory of town. What comedic gold awaited in town, at Mike's shop or in the aisles of the hardware store? But let's just say, buckle up, because Jack's shopping spree is about to get utterly ridiculous. Now, Farmer Jack set of to town to have his first stop at trusty Mike's mechanical works. Getting his truck a new lease of life was the prime objective. Some purchases afterwards, and Jack will be heading back to the glory of hammering it out in the heated sun. After an hour or two awaiting the diagnosis of Jack's truck, Mike came with some bad news. The repair is going to take a couple of days, but she will be as good as, well, she was the last 10 years or so. Mike suggests giving our farmer Jack a lift back to the farm so that repairs can commence. But Jack, being the farmer he is, will take a stroll home through the Veld after a short shopping spree. While in town, Jack bought two prized chickens, a goose to get egg production skyrocketing again, a bucket and a tin of paint. Now Jack can set off homewards, but he had a problem carrying everything that he bought to his farm. As he was figuring it out, an old lady came over to ask for directions as she was a bit lost. Jack had a look at the address she showed him, and won't you know, it was close to his farm. So Jack explained to the lady that she will have to walk with him. However, he asked if she could help him carry the chicken as he was out of hands for his purchases. The old lady gave everything a look and then said, Put the paint in the bucket, the bucket in one hand, a chicken under each arm, and the goose in your other hand. Jack gave it a go, and as you know, it worked. So off they went. On their way, Jack noticed an ally that would cut the distance in half and said, I'd let's take a shortcut, I know the route. The old lady said, And I'm an old lady, without protection. Do you think I will take a chance of going alone through an alley with you? What if you try to have your way with me? Lady, I am carrying a bucket, tin of paint, two chickens and a goose. How on dear earth will I be able to do that? The woman said, You put the goose down, put the bucket over him, put the can of paint on top of the bucket so the goose can't escape. And then, my dear, I will hold the two chickens for you. <laughs> In our second story joke of the day, we bring you a classic story about a lamp and a genie, but this genie is obviously out of practice. Buckle up, because in today's cartoon story joke, we're about to dive headfirst into a joke that's funnier than a hamster riding a Roomba. 
Ever heard those tales about finding a dusty lamp, rubbing it, and out pops a genie ready to grant your wildest wishes? Three wishes, poof, instant gratification. Sounds like a dream job, right? Well, hold on to your magic carpets, folks, because being a genie is about as glamorous as a sock puppet convention. Imagine being stuck in a bottle for centuries, only to be yanked out by some eager soul demanding world peace or perfectly wrinkle-free shirts. It's basically customer service for wishes, with a healthy dose of be careful what you wish for, thrown in for good measure. But you've heard the stories, right? Rub a dusty lamp, out pops a fabulous being in sparkly pants, ready to grant your wildest dreams. Three wishes, bam, instant gratification. Sounds like a sweet gig, doesn't it? Well, let me tell you, from the other side of the lampshade, it's not all sunshine and smoky exits. Being a genie is a bit like being a customer service rep for wishes. You get the full spectrum of human desire, from the truly epic, I want to be a billionaire rock star astronaut, to the mind-numbingly mundane, can you make my socks magically fold themselves? And don't even get me started on the loopholes. We genies have our lawyers, tiny, fire-breathing ones, naturally, for a reason. You'd be surprised how many people try to twist their wishes into 10 or 12. I wish for world peace, but only on Tuesdays, rolls eyes. Then there's the whole, be careful what you wish for thing. Let's just say I've seen more monkeys paws than a zoo. One guy wished to be the most handsome man alive. Poof. Instant Fabio haircut, chiseled jawline, and the inability to leave the house because every woman within a 10 mile radius fainted at the sight of him. Not exactly the smooth sailing he envisioned. Look, don't get me wrong, there are perks. The all you can eat buffet in the genie lounge is legendary. Flaming hot Cheetos and ambrosia, anyone? And let's face it, who wouldn't love the occasional trip to Bora Bora to poof someone onto a deserted island for being a jerk? But mostly, it's just a job. A slightly smoky, sparkly, wish-granting job. So next time you find a lamp, consider this. Maybe the genie inside just wants a decent cup of coffee and someone to vent to about the existential angst of being stuck in a bottle. We're not just magical wish machines, you know. We have feelings too though mostly heartburn from all those flaming hot Cheetos. All righty, folks. Buckle up tighter than a squirrel on a roller coaster, because we're about to launch into a joke that's funnier than a mime stuck in a bubble wrap factory. A woman walked along the beach when she stumbled upon a genie's lamp. She picked it up and rubbed it, and lo and behold, a genie appeared. The amazed woman soon came back to her senses and asked if she got three wishes. The genie said, Nope. Due to inflation, constant downsizing, fierce global competition, and low wages in third world countries, I can only grant you one wish. So, what shall it be? The woman didn't hesitate, she said. I want peace in the Middle East. See this map? I want these countries to stop fighting with each other. The genie looked at the map and exclaimed, Good lady, these countries have been at war for thousands of years. I'm out of shape after being in a bottle for centuries. I'm good, but not that good. I don't think it can be done. Make another wish. The woman thought for a few minutes and said, Well, I've never been able to find the right man. You know, one that's considerate and fun, likes to cook and helps with the house cleaning, is good in bed and gets along with my family, doesn't watch sports all the time, and is faithful. That's what I wish for. A 100% perfect good mate. The genie let out a long sigh, shook his head and said, Let me see that mop again. <laughs> Our third joke of the day is a story about a moth visiting a doctor. It's a really funny joke with a hilarious punchline. You won't believe this. A moth walks into a doctor's office. Yep, a full-fledged, fuzzy, nocturnal moth. He flutters nervously onto the examination table, his wings all singed and tattered. The doctor, a seasoned professional stare in utter bewilderment. 
Well, that's our story joke of the day, and it's going to be a good one. So, relax. Sit down, and let's see how it unfolds. So, the doctor started by saying, I haven't seen one of you ever in my surgery before. So this is a first for me. But what can I do for you, little fella? At this stage, the moth gets a sad look on his face. He took a deep sigh and then said, Doc, I'm at my wit's end. My wife, she's never around. And when she is, she's constantly surrounded by a swarm of what I can only assume are her children. I haven't had a decent night's sleep in years. I think my wife is cheating on me. I don't know who of those children are mine anymore. But then again, she was always a social butterfly. Now, you can only imagine the doctor's surprise as the moth continues. My kids are growing up too fast. Some of my daughters are already attracting unwanted attention from the older moth crowd. I just can't keep up anymore. I'm not ready for all that, you know? Interesting. Anything else troubling you? Doc, you wouldn't believe the stress, and it's been a very hard life. I spend my whole life dodging bats and birds, barely have time to myself. Never had a vacation, spend quality time with my children, and haven't seen a decent sunset in ages. The doctor's jaw hangs open. He's never encountered a patient quite like this. He doesn't really know what to make of all of this, but he let the moth continue with his emotional outpouring. I've burned my wings so many times, you know. It's difficult getting around. Lately, I have been constantly tired, especially since my brother died. Poor guy got zapped by one of those human fly traps the other day. On his way to work, the poor soul. He was a good moth. Why do bad things always happen to good moths? At this stage, the doctor is sure that what the patient needs is not a vet, but rather a psychiatrist, and he is ready for his verdict, so he said. Sir, I appreciate your honesty, but I'm afraid I'm not quite the specialist you need. This sounds more like a mental health issue. However, I can refer you to a fantastic psychiatrist who might be able to help. My receptionist can schedule an appointment for you, if that's okay. Another appointment? All right, fine. As the moth are ready to leave, the doctor has a final question for the moth. He asks, Just out of curiosity, how did you even hear about my practice? The moth turned around with a grin on his face. Oh no, I have never heard from you before, doctor. I just happened to be flying by and saw the light was on. We moths, we can't resist a good light. Our fourth joke of the day, we bring you a small town, and that lady that's always the gossip queen. Yes, she knows everyone's story, but can she be stopped? In today's cartoon, Millie Featherbottom, the town gossip queen, discovered that karma can be a real chatterbox. Hold on to your hats, or bonnets, if you're Millie, for more small town antics, where the biggest unsolved mystery is still Mayor Higgins' humming repertoire. Is it show tunes, cult chants? We may never know. Ah, small towns and their gossip, where the biggest excitement is usually the annual pie contest. Third place goes to Mrs. Henderson again, bless her heart, but that crust, Cardboard City. And everyone knows everyone's business better than their own laundry detergent preferences. Now, news travels fast in the city, sure, but in a small town, forget Twitter, it's Mabel down at the bakery with a fresh croissant and a side of piping hot gossip. Mabel knows who borrowed Mrs. Peabody's hedge clippers. It was young Billy Johnson, bless his tinker-prone soul. Why Mr. Thompson's prize-winning pumpkin mysteriously exploded last Halloween. Turns out raccoons have a taste for the finer gourds. And the real reason Mayor Higgins keeps humming show tunes in the town square. It's not karaoke night practice, nope, not at all. Alrighty, gossip lovers, buckle up for today's chuckle. Seems Millie Featherbottom, the human rumor mill, got a taste of her own medicine, and let's just say it wasn't Grandma's prune juice. Let's dish the dirt. Mildred Millie Featherbottom was a woman who believed information was power, and gossip was her personal superpower. As the self-proclaimed guardian of the First Baptist Church's morals, Millie knew everyone's business or at least her embellished version of it. 
From the shade of Mrs. Periwinkle's new curtains to the questionable amount of time young Harold spent bird watching by the creek, nothing escaped Millie's watchful eye and even more watchful ear. Now, the good folks at First Baptist mostly tolerated Millie. They knew better than to cross her. A raised eyebrow from Millie could turn a minor mishap into a full-blown morality play. But Millie, bless her heart, had a nose for trouble that rivaled a truffle pig. And trouble came in the form of a quite man named Mike Johnson. Mike, a recent widower, had moved to Charlottesville a few months prior. He wasn't much for talking, preferring the company of his trusty pickup truck, a beat-up Ford named Rusty, to idle chatter. This, of course, made him a cipher in Millie's world. A blank page, simply begging to be filled with exciting and likely scandalous details. One sunny Wednesday afternoon, Millie was out for her daily walk, a mission that often included a strategic loop past the Rusty Nail, Charlottesville-only pub. As fate would have it, she spotted Rusty parked outside. Now, Millie knew full well that a car parked outside a pub doesn't automatically equate to its owner being inside knocking back beers. But for Millie, a suspicious mind was a fertile mind, and a juicy story was about to sprout. The next morning at Bible study, Millie couldn't contain herself. Between discussions on the importance of tithing and the evils of premarital handholding, she dropped her bombshell. Did anyone see Mike Johnson's truck outside the rusty nail yesterday? She inquired, her voice dripping with faux concern. A collective gasp rippled through the room. A few exchanged nervous glances. Poor Mike, oblivious to the brewing gossip storm, sat quietly taking notes. Millie, emboldened by the shocked silence, continued. Such a shame, really, a newcomer falling into such temptations. We must all pray for his soul. Mike, still silent, absorbed the veiled accusations. He finished his note-taking, then slowly rose and met Millie's gaze with a look that could curdle milk. But instead of the expected outburst or denial, Mike simply turned and walked out. Millie, momentarily stunned, puffed up her chest. See, the man is clearly ashamed, she declared, but a seed of doubt had been planted. Later that evening, as Charlottesville settled into its nightly quiet, a familiar rumble echoed down Elm Street. It was Mike, back in his truck, but instead of heading home, he pulled up right outside Millie's picture-perfect picket fence and parked. Millie, peering out her window, saw the truck and felt a flicker of unease. Mike climbed out, not a beer bottle in sight, and simply walked away. Rusty sat there all night, bathed in the soft glow of Millie's porch light. Every creak of its rusty frame, every groan of its aging engine, seemed to echo Millie's growing anxiety. Sleep evaded her that night. By morning, the entire town was buzzing with a new mystery. What was Mike doing parked outside Millie's house all night? The following Sunday, Mike finally addressed the elephant in the room, or rather, the truck in Millie's driveway. During the service, he stood up, his voice a low rumble. There seems to be some confusion about my truck. Yes, it was parked outside the pub, but I wasn't drinking. I was there for a job interview, fixing the leaky roof. He paused, letting the silence settle. And yes, it was parked outside Millie's house all night, because after seeing my truck outside a place I wasn't even in, I decided to give her a taste of her own medicine. Millie's face, the color of a ripe tomato, crumpled. The congregation erupted in suppressed laughter. From that day on, Millie's gossip took on a decidedly less accusatory tone. And Mike? Well, Mike and Rusty became regulars at the First Baptist Church, though thankfully, never parked outside again. <laughs> In our last joke of the day, we bring you a story about the game of golf and a leprechaun. It's a hilarious joke worth watching. In today's funny cartoon story joke, we fill you with the humor of a leprechaun that finds himself on the wrong end of a bad golf swing. 
hold on to your hats, because this origin story might blow your mind. Well, maybe tickle it. Before we embark on this laugh riot, we'll take a quick detour to discover where these tiny terrors came from. Get ready for something funnier than a pair of socks searching for their partner in the dryer. Long before tourists flooded Ireland with shamrocks and Guinness, leprechauns were just tiny, grumpy fellas with a serious gold obsession. It all started with Finnegan McBoozy, a giant with an appetite that rivaled a bottomless pit. One day, Finnegan stumbled upon a grumpy little dude hammering away at something shiny. Oi, what you got there, short stack? boomed Finnegan, his voice cracking the very ground. The little guy, startled, dropped his hammer, revealing a pot overflowing with gold coins. Blimey, that's enough gold to buy every potato in Ireland. The leprechaun, aghast, sputtered. Those are my retirement savings. Give them back. Finnegan, ever the charmer, chuckled. Now, now, little fella. How about a deal? You fill my pockets with gold, and I'll leave you with enough to buy a decent thimble. Thus began the leprechaun's legendary stinginess. They learned a valuable lesson that day. Never trust a giant with a bottomless stomach and a penchant for borrowing. From then on, they became notorious for guarding their gold with a fierce and often hilarious determination, forever remembered as the mischievous little hoarders of Irish folklore. Did you know leprechauns have a union? Turns out, guarding pots of gold is hazardous work. They even have a dental plan, because apparently, all that gold isn't good for their tiny teeth. Buckle up, because this joke about a disgruntled leprechaun filing a grievance is about to leave you shamrocking with laughter. Picture this, a crisp Irish morning, the sun dappling through the ancient trees of a renowned golf course. Our protagonist, Seamus O'Flanagan, a man with a swing as unpredictable as the weather, lines up for his drive on the 18th hole. With a mighty heave, he unleashes his club, sending the ball soaring, straight into the thick, gnarled woods bordering the fairway. Seamus trudges into the undergrowth, cursing his wayward shot. As he pushes through the foliage, a flash of green catches his eye. There, lying prone with a colossal bump on his head, is a tiny figure, a leprechaun. Beside him, nestled innocently, lies Seamus's wayward golf ball. Horrified, Seamus grabs his water bottle and frantically splashes the little guy, reviving him with a jolt. Oh, what happened? The leprechaun croaks, rubbing his head. I'm so sorry. I must have hit you with my golf ball. Seamus exclaimed. The leprechaun, surprisingly spry, dusts himself off. Well, you've certainly given old Paddy a good whack there. But fear not, for I am a leprechaun, and as such, I grant you three wishes. Seamus, still shaken, stammers. Thank heavens you're all right. I don't need anything. I just hope you're okay. He turns and walks away, leaving the leprechaun bewildered. Now that's a decent fella. The leprechaun mutters to himself. He deserves something for his kindness. I'll bestow upon him the three things I'd most desire. A legendary golf game, wealth beyond his wildest dreams, and a love life hotter than a Dublin pub on St. Patrick's Day. A year later, Seamus finds himself back on the same course, standing on the very same 18th hole. As expected, his drive finds its familiar home in the woods. But this time, waiting for him with a mischievous grin, is the leprechaun. Well, 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 if it isn't the fellow who gifted me the most spectacular goose egg I've ever sported. Tell me, how's that golf game of yours? The leprechaun chuckles, Seamus beams. It's phenomenal. I'm a world-renowned golfer now, traveling the globe and winning tournaments left and right. Excellent. And how about your financial situation? Are you rolling in the dough? The leprechaun claps his tiny hands. Seamus pulls out a wad of hundred-dollar bills from his pocket. Money? It seems to magically appear whenever I need it. Splendid. Now the most important question. How's your love life? The leprechaun exclaims, rubbing his hands together. Seamus blushes, looking sheepishly at the ground. Well, it's decent. The leprechaun leans in, his eyes wide with curiosity. Decent, you say? 
Come on, be honest. How often are we talking? Once or twice a week, maybe. The leprechaun's jaw drops. Once or twice a week. That's it? After all I've done for you? Well, that's not bad for a Catholic priest in a small parish, is it? <laughs> If you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here. <laughs>